going on is 7.0. I don't have any cards of uh, public comments. Any public comments? All right. Moving on to 8.0. AATA representative. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for being here, and happy new year to everybody. Um, 8.2 CSEA representative. Uh, happy new year, and welcome back. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Excellent. Uh, 8.3, Brianna. Good evening, members of the board. Thank you for having me tonight and taking the time to listen to my report of student happenings at Vasquez. This week, students return to school, ready to start off 2018 on the right foot. The energy in the classroom is impeccable. Students diligently work to learn new material, as well as review old material in preparation for finals in two weeks. I had the opportunity to attend math tutoring that Vasquez generously offers at school on Monday through Wednesday. I'm glad to report the amount of students that attended was high, and it was great to see my fellow classmates were dedicated to fully understanding the materials being taught, as well as the teachers devoting their time to help us succeed. On Monday, January 8th, Anatomy and Physiology and Special Education <coughs> students had the opportunity to visit the Post Body Worlds exhibit as well as view the Space Shuttle Endeavor at the California Science Center in Los Angeles. As far as life outside the classroom, soccer and basketball both had games this week and they are dominating. Both girls and boys soccer came out with a win against Desert Christian on Tuesday. Girls basketball followed their lead with a beat against Desert Christian, but boys basketball was not as lucky. Girls basketball also had the chance to visit the University of Southern California to tour the campus and watch a collegiate women's basketball game. In other news, we will be welcoming the Young Americans group to Vasquez from January 12th through 14th for a workshop open to grades 3rd through 12th. This workshop will help students build confidence while working on their performance skills. Today, our basketball and soccer teams will travel to Mojave to take on the Mojave Mustangs. Students are also looking forward to our Havana night themed winter formal, which will be taking on taking place on February 8th. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brianna. That's perfect. Very good to have you here. All right, uh, we're moving on to 8.4, new construction. Mr. King. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Porter and Brianna. Welcome this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. So very brief comments on new construction, as that's a uh, as I'm sure you've noted, a big part of our agenda this evening. Um, so we'll be getting to uh, Vasquez High School in Phase 3 uh, during the meeting. So, uh, and with Acton School, um, we can talk about that next week as well. On the 18th, we have a special board meeting, as you know, dedicated to that. So I'm not going to spend uh, really any time on new construction. Uh, in terms of safe routes to schools, uh, we've added that to the superintendent's report, or to, it's one of the items on here, right? Yes. Let's say five. I jumped ahead, Mr. President. That's all right. That's all right. So eight, you're in the eight five now. Okay. Any uh, report on the new routes? Uh, very, safe routes to school? Yeah, very minimal. Uh, we're arranging an initial meeting with, uh, meeting with Caltrans representative. His name is Mr. Phil Tonko. I'm sure possibly Ms. Ayers here tonight. Right, so, so you may know that name. It's probably more familiar to you than me. But we do have a meeting uh, that we are working on setting up with him. And once the meeting is scheduled, I'll, inf I'll inform the board and, and I'll, I'll let you know as well, just so that you know we are, we are following up on this item. All right. Um, 8.6, anything for superintendent report? I do. Uh, a few different things. So the first thing is um, I want to thank you, Mr. Porter. Last night we spent. Uh, several hours at the Agua Dulce Town Council. Uh, Mr. Porter was uh, pro tem president for that meeting and uh, during that time had me on the agenda as a doing a presentation, sort of a mini state of the district, I suppose, an introduction uh, for myself. And it was an excellent group. It was a really nice group to speak to. Uh, the California Highway Patrol is there that, that uh, works in our area along with the sheriff, Sheriff Short, Deputy Short, and uh, the fire department was there as well. So some nice connections for me because I've been wanting to meet with those people so we're able to exchange cards and do some of those things. And Larry, actually some of the things that you want to do, you mentioned and you made connection with the right people there like from the sheriff's department and the <coughs> fire department as, as a resource. Yeah, the safety is, is the number one thing anytime you're a new teacher or a new principal or a new superintendent, always health and welfare of our students is number one and to that end, 
um, really interested in working with our, our counterparts in the area on disaster drills. Uh, as, as I, I hate the words active shooter drills, but it's important. We have to talk about it. We have to put it out there. We have to be prepared. And it's an unfortunate reality uh, 40 years later from when I was a child and went to school, but it is what it is. And, and that's the smart thing to do. So thank you for that, though. You did a great job. Thank you for being there. Absolutely. Thank very you. Very proud of you. Thank you. Um, the, ne the next thing is, is Miss Ford here? Miss Maggie Ford? Thank you. Hi. Hi, Miss Ford. So Miss Ford and I met two days ago. She is the uh, CEO of um, Einstein Academy, Albert Einstein Academy. And I wanted to make it public and let the board know as well, there's, um, like all of us in school districts, private, charter, or public, we deal with financial constraints. We deal with issues all the time. And so they're dealing with some of those things right now. I wanted to just make a public comment that as they're going through those things, they're in a difficult time right now. However, they are looking at a viable option. I wanted the board to know that. And so next week, I'll be able to come back to the 18th and say, hey, that viable option worked out, and uh, we're going to continue the excellent relationship that we have with the Albert Einstein Academy, um, and, and look forward to that. I know there's a history there. One of the three uh, sites that they have is in our school district, Hubbard Dual State. That's important and near and dear to us, and so we appreciate everything you've done and what you're doing, uh, and, and we look forward to the continued work together. Should that not be a viable option, then, then we'll, we'll talk further and, and I'll let the board know. Okay, I, I, one second. Just for a matter of record, we have, our staff has communicated our concerns. Uh, Thank you, yeah. In writing uh, to AEA, and uh, you know, uh, we hope to hear good news next week. Thank you, that's correct, uh, absolutely. So, um, this is a, yeah, go ahead. So just so everybody understands, this isn't just popping up. There's a formalized timeline that happens, and there's reviews and things that happen. So if something comes up at a certain time, it's mandated that you would express those concerns, and there's a, there's a protocol for responding and reviewing it, so it's not something that just pops up. Great. Any further comments? I do have three more things to cover. The next one is the Fair Funding California Resolution, which I'll bring to you in February. I just want to give you a heads up that, that CSBA has asked school districts around the state to support the notion that um, it's a fact that we are one of the lowest funded states per student ADA throughout the nation. We are working together as superintendents collaboratively to have each of our boards adopt the resolution to encourage the state in Sacramento to make us one of the top 10 funded states in the nation rather than at the bottom. So I'd like to bring that resolution to you forward. I'm not asking for any sort of uh, consensus at this time. It's just commentary. And so I'll be bringing that forward in, in February. Can you also mention the fact that there's $3 billion in? I'm getting there. Okay. You are right on the spot. You're excellent. So it's a good segue. So the governor's proposal, proposal came out this morning. Um, next week, my, I will be at the School Services of California interpretation of the governor's proposal, which comes out in January. And uh, Ms. David, our, our, uh, our acting, at the moment, acting CBO, will be in Sacramento to hear the same message there. And she will also be able to have very um, candid conversation at a special invitation kind of only um, session for CBOs in the, in the state of California. So she'll be able to get first-hand information. But at this time, there's a guarantee of an increase to Proposition 98 funds of $3.1 billion for the 18-19 school year. Uh, the total Proposition 98-18-19 budget is $78.3 billion. There's some other monies that are being allocated as well, including a $640 million bond uh, capacity measure for the school year 18-19. Um, CSBA is continually advocating for the release of $7 billion that was approved by voters in November 2016 for construction and modernization. So that's another one that's, that's kind of a, a really important item for, uh, for us to know about. Um, while this is all good news, and certainly something that is very positive, um, it's, it's, it's almost, we don't want to um, kind of make plans to go to Hawaii with our taxes until we get the refund. 
So um, with, with that metaphor in mind, let's see what happens with the May revise. Let's see what, uh, what, what comes in. And when it does come in, the funds will begin to trickle in in July and throughout the 1819 school year. So just in terms of, of cash flow and thinking about that, it's not something we necessarily would want to spend right now, but certainly it is a, it is a positive uh, <coughs> uh, outlook as we look ahead. Um, they are one-time funds, but nonetheless positive. Brianna, you spoke a little bit about the Young Americans Workshop. I just want to make everybody aware this is an exciting, exciting opportunity. This is a, a three-day event. So for those who don't know, um, and I just learned this, these are young college students that are uh, in the performing arts, um, and they visit throughout the nation uh, schools. And then they take students for three days from uh, elementary school through high school, and, and create an ensemble and a show. So the culmination on Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. will be that show. So for the next three days, they will build up to that show. It's supposed to be fabulous. I looked at some other shows online. They're amazing, but I do want to thank and recognize Mr. Ty DeVoe for helping us facility-wise at the last moment have the high school ready for this because it was supposed to be in, uh, in the Ventura, Ohio area, but due to the fires, they weren't able to host it. So at the last minute, they contacted our performing arts teacher, um, Amy Ciceri, who, who absolutely was on top of it. She was a young American performer herself. So um, she was excited about it, asked if the district could, uh, could, could assist, and Ms. David, Mr. DeVoe, absolutely made sure that the facilities came through and were ready, and so this is exciting. Good news. So. Um, the last piece um, uh, that I have, Mr. President, is my visit with ASB, uh, and the, the, the leadership group, uh, the activity student, activity student, what is it? Thank you. Associated, association student of student body, associated student body. Thank you. ASB. ASB. That's what I always say, ASB. So I'm not a high school guy. I'm elementary, middle school, but you know, I'm, my high school involvement would last eight years longer from a district level perspective. But I visited with ASB the other day. They were amazing. So proud of our students at our high school, middle school, and elementary school. But we, um, we did put together a little video for, for you that we're going to show you in just a moment, kind of following in light of the growth mindset and stay gold and so on, and what you shared, uh, 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 Melissa Trussell, when you've been at our board meetings. But uh, before we show it, I just want to thank Mr. DeVoe. Special thank you to Ms. Amy Ciceri uh, for, for allowing me to visit the classroom, having your students participate in this. And then the um, Heather Lundquist, who is the video production journalism teacher, thank you so much as she spent the last 24 hours helping to put this together and her students were amazing. So this is a grassroots effort from our students who participated in the video to the students who made the video which I think they did a, a bang up job. I love Hollywood, you know, and I wouldn't want normal 
skin, you know, because it's such like a trophy and it's something that makes me so me, you know. So like my biggest insecurity is not like what one of my best assets. And, and that was like my stable moment was what I learned in my childhood. Our stay gold moment is the power of hearing stories, learning from students, staff, and parents. Realize your full potential. What is your stay gold moment? <laughs> so just just a little bit of a background, and thank you for being our our test audience. Um, this was a. Uh, our first effort and our first video with more to come, but Mr. DeVoe and myself and, and uh, video production teacher Ms. Lundquist were looking at this board, say here's our, here's our first shot at it, there'll be more to come, but this is our way and we look at this as something that will go out on YouTube once we have our Twitter account up, there'll be a link to it and that sort of thing, but what does this have to do with education? Right? There is an immense amount of literature about something that probably the majority of us already realize. That if we have positive, good relationships with our teachers, with our administrators, with our board, with our parents, then students want to learn and will do better. Nobody wants to, I won't say nobody, few of us find academic success in a punitive environment. Everything we do is relationship-based. Human resources, business services, instructional services, <coughs> educational services, and special education are all here to support our students. And all of that work is done and premised on good, solid relationships. And I spent an hour with those students, as I've done several times with a variety of students since I've been here, and I'm amazed at what our students have to offer. And, and I'm just so proud of it. So uh, thank you for all the support and time that went into this, Mr. DeVoe. I appreciate it. And thank you for being our first <laughs> test audience. Uh, I'm sure Mr. DeVoe and I learned some things just kind of watching it and hearing it. And so if you couldn't hear the audio completely, what she was talking about was her skin condition. And for her, her stay gold moment was the moment she realized that the skin condition was no longer a hindrance and something she felt horrible about in terms of <coughs> self-image, but it was an asset. And she was saying that the, the, the one image on her forehead was a, I don't remember what it was. Seahorse. 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 And so, so it became something very positive for her. So we'll talk about these moments a lot. They're important. And thank you. Appreciate your time, board. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. King. You know, it's all about fostering the right environment, the safe environment uh, for our children to learn and to get ready for society and for the workforce and for their lives. And I uh, really commend that you, you have a very good knack for that and great heart towards it. Thanks. So we're going to move on to 8.7, board member comments. Uh, I'll start with Ms. Jensen. Uh, anything? I don't have a lot tonight. I just want to say Happy New Year to everyone and our staff and our uh, students and welcome um, Ms. Corey to our, um, to our board. We're happy to have you. Um, just over the month of December, I did what I love. I love seeing children. And um, thank you to um, our Metal Art School for their great performance. That was wonderful. You know, it's not everyone that gets a live band to sing. You get, you know, the, the CD that you hope doesn't skip when you're singing, and they had everything. That was just amazing. I loved every minute of it. And also on the 21st, going to the High Desert, the winter performance, that was wonderful. Um, if you didn't get a chance to attend that, it was hilarious. Those kids had a great little skit and some great music. So thank you to all the staff that put that together. Um, and Mr. Bo, thank you for doing that. I know that was short notice, putting that, um, that the um, Young American Workshop together. I saw the email and I saw it on our website, so I appreciate you doing that for, for our students. And um, Mr. King and Mr. DeVoe, thank you for that golden moment. I, I love the state gold, and so um, I look forward to seeing more of that, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Falsgraf. Uh, welcome, Brianna. Um, uh, board member Jansen <coughs> danced all over my uh, joyous holiday speech here. Um, I enjoyed High Desert. It was genuine, full of energy. Uh, Metal Arc was awesome. But 
the holidays are over, so let's get back to work now. Um, <laughs> you were supposed to laugh right there. Thank you. Um, what, what, I want to talk a little bit about the traffic uh, sign down here that's become very unpopular with speeders and people like to blow through the sign. I'm glad to see that that stop sign is up at Santiago and Soledad. I think by making people stop, they're only going 80 instead of 100 when they get to Wisconsin, go Badgers. Um, I think it creates breaks in the traffic and I know that um, the state patrol has been around um, and I think I would remind everyone whether when you're leaving going east in the morning out of a school and you've got mud on your windshield because of the way the weather is around here and it's glaring in your eyes and you got the text going on and you got all this stuff going on I want to remind everybody I think law says when somebody puts their foot on the roadway as a pedestrian you just stop your car so I think slowly but surely things are getting better even at Vasquez I'm going to suggest that the last person who insists on driving up the wrong way that we honorarily named the king or queen of England. Ty, you sent a really good message this afternoon, late this afternoon. You talked about all kinds of things, things that are coming on quick. Some of these presentations are dynamic, so I want to thank you for that. Um, Tad, about branding, that was a big part of why I wanted to be here. Uh, sitting up here on the board. I want to thank Ms. Lundquist and her team for putting this together. I know they worked very hard on very short notice. Um, but, you know, when we get up here and sit on, on this board and we're looking at the businesses and the problems and all that kind of thing, sometimes we forget that the students and their performance and their social competencies are really the strongest brand of our, our district. So I'm very pleased uh, with the newsletter that came out. Um, it's about the students. I'm very pleased with the way the senior staff is going to the sites, and, and it's not a uh, mandatory, I'm watching you type of thing. I'm seeing an interactive role, people uh, communicating, helping teach the class. The educators are into it. I know some school districts, if you walk in the room at the wrong time and sign the co not in the contract, that's a problem. Um, I would hope that the movies we're seeing here, if they can be linked to uh, the digital version of your newsletter, that would be good, where you could just click the link. Or, um, <coughs> I really appreciate the patience of, of the community and staff at High Desert, High Desert School. We've been through some transition and some absences and things, and I know that the site principals and everybody have come together to try to make it all work. Um, and just be patient, we're, we're, you're gonna see our org chart is gonna be becoming less fluid and less reactive as we get going here. Um, Again, all the staff members who have stepped forward in the last year to take on additional duties, I, I very much appreciate that um, in ways you can't imagine. It's got us through some rough times, and it speaks to your commitment to the district and its students. Um, uh, finally, when we get to the personnel item 10.1 and 10.3, I'll, I'll have some comments that I would like to reflect in minutes. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Postback. Mr. Fox? Uh, nothing. Thank you. Mr. Layton? Uh, very short tonight. I'll just say welcome to Brianna, and I hope you enjoy your stay with us. And uh, the stay is going to be as much or as little as you want. We've had board members that stayed here to the wee hours, which we don't ask you to do. Uh, my understanding is some of the, the student reps have even left early right after they finish their little part and to go about their business. Other reps, when I've been, I've been on the board now 12 years, and back in the beginning, they usually stayed all the way to the end and participated. And I just want to express to you, if I haven't already, when you were first selected, um, the selection, what you want to do is totally up to you. You're welcome to stay here and and put your two cents in because we always want it. We're doing. We're all here for what's best for the kids, and so we want to hear from you. And um, perhaps this may be something that will be a a memory for you. I, I like to use a term. It's called making a memory. The problem with the result of making a memory is you never know you're doing it when you're doing it. You may remember it the rest of your life. And I'd like you to, when you look back on this short time that you've had in governing at the grassroots, which is 
school districts, presidents, and governors start off in this lowly position. And uh, hopefully you'll look back and say, I learned something from this, I enjoyed it, as opposed to I wanted something to put on my resume. So I too say welcome. Thank you. I look forward to being here. Thank you, Mr. Layton. Um, as far as my comments, just a couple of things real quick. Um, Brianna, welcome. Thanks for having you here. And what you're doing here for the board and for the students is about service, okay? But keep that in mind always. That's one thing I learned from Mark Testasso. He always emphasized on that. It's about service, and so it's some, that's what you're doing. I will consider... Um, your service to us to, to have been uh, met by 8.2, which is your comments. It's up to you to say after that if you want. And I would recommend that you do as much or as little as you like. If your school comes first, I would recommend that you, you go home and do your school stuff. But once you've made your report, you're welcome to leave. And uh, in general, uh, students have done their own thing. So don't think won't, you know, we'll judge you one way or the other. It's totally up to you, okay? By the time you give any of that, great job at your report today. Um, the winter program at Vasquez, I didn't get a chance to go to High Desert or Metal Earth. I went to Vasquez, it was incredible. And uh, uh, Mrs. Cesare does an amazing job, and I would pay to see that show. I would pay a good dollar to see that show. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, I was a little embarrassed at the end, they put me up there in the I wasn't expecting that in the, in the Santa costume, but the kids are very professional and it's just, it's just a wonderful program and she's really taken these kids, some of whom were kind of introverts for lack of a better word, and kind of really made them come out of their shell and I'm just proud of so many of those kids because about maybe seven or ten of them I've known since they were in kindergarten, so it's just a really cool thing for parents to see that. and. Uh, um, and thank you, Ty, for um, fostering that program and helping out with that. Um, just a comment as far as graduation this year for class of 2018. Graduation, as for Mr. DeVoy, I talked to him earlier, is on June 6th. And the last day of school is June 13th this year. And also, as uh, Mr. King uh, um, touched up on earlier, there's a superintendent conference. Uh, starting next week, and on the 25th and the 26th, there's uh, luncheons and programs for board members that are free for us to attend, okay? Uh, these are luncheons that would normally be $100 to be at, and they're free for board members to attend. I'm going to attend uh, one or two of those, and uh, uh, I shared with Mr. Layton um, the information, and I uh, suggest uh, any board member that might be interested to get the information in the tent. It's uh, um, basically a, the state superintendent himself will be there at one of the luncheons. So um, I did I did this years back uh, in um, I believe 2012 or 11, and uh, I, I went with Dr. Woodard, and it was at one of those luncheons that Dr. Woodard met one of the two people that were instrumental in him securing the. Uh, matching portion of our fund. So they can be very beneficial if you take the time. And I, I applaud you for being there. So, um, and that's it as far as my board member comments. Uh, anything from anyone else? Yeah, Ellie, did you say uh, graduation June 6th? June 6th, yes. And the last day of school for our district is June 13th. Thank you. All right. So um, we're moving on to 9.0. It's recommended that the board approve the following consent agenda items. We separated 9.5 and 9.6 uh, for public edification at the beginning of our meeting at 6.30. We're going to vote on those separately, the National University Student Teaching um, Agreement uh, and uh, the inter Internship Credential Program Agreement. 9.5 and 9.6 will be voted on separately. We're, current, we're now voting on 9.1 till 9.4. Uh, minutes of the special board meeting, December 11. Uh, minutes of December 14. Uh, 9.3 warrant register, that's paying out bills. And 9.4 personnel action report. 
Do I have a move for 9.1 through 9.4? Move. Second. Thank you. Ken and Larry, any discussion? Just uh, one, one comment, Mr. President. Uh, on 9.4, I'd just like to comment that uh, that's regarding the, the personnel action report. We, one of the resignations on there I think is noteworthy, uh, not that they all aren't, but <coughs> in particular uh, Mr. Rudraja, Dr. Rudraja is on there. And so I just want to acknowledge his, uh, his service with the district, his time with the district, and uh, appreciate that and wish him well uh, in his future endeavors. Thank you. So that's the resignation of our uh, former CFO, Dr. Woodrush. Correct, and it's effective uh, January 15th. Thank you for pointing that out. Sure. Okay, all in favor, aye. 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 All right, so that's a 5-0-0 on 9.1 to 9.4. And now I'm going to open, I'm going to ask a separate move uh, for 9.5 and 9.6. I'll move that in, 9.5 and 9.6. I'll second. Okay. So opened by me and uh, seconded by Mr. Falstraff. Okay, now let's have discussion on 9.5 and 9.6. Mr. King? Yeah, basically this is formalizing our relationship with National University like we've done with USC and other uh, institutions. It allows us to build a relationship with those universities formally to allow for uh, student teaching to take place and the contract allows for also the other separation, 9.6 uh, is the internship. So there are two different contracts because one is for student teaching and one is for an internship with, which uh, personnel-wise are two di type of different uh, uh, personnel reps. So uh, our recommendation to the board is to uh, uh, formalize these this evening. Please. Just out of curiosity, have we had a relationship with these uh, particular, um, this particular university before or is this a new relationship? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. We, have, we have had relationship with National University before. We haven't been using them up until this point, and now there's an opportunity for a relationship yeah. this year. And Thank you. The entire agreements, both agreements, are in the public packet for review. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Latham? Well, the, I was the one that had it pulled out of uh, the. Uh, what do you call it, uh, consent agenda because of the extensiveness of the contracts. And I just felt that, that it is something that we needed to explain as opposed to having it uh, on just automatically sure. to consent. And I would just inquire is, are you happy with the two contracts? Um, the uh, If they were drafted by lawyers or the uh, university, the other university or not, be, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, don't get me wrong, but there, there is an attorney provision here on uh, page four, and we just spend a fortune on lawyers. And so I just wanted to point out that if there ever is any problem and it goes into any type of hiring a lawyer. I'm not going to even say litigation. Uh, that this contract doesn't say each person pays for their own lawyer. Uh, I don't think it does anyway. Yeah, it says the prevailing party. In other words, there's a, a legal issue there that can be different than the issue of the dispute. The dispute can be worth 25 cents and our attorney obligation to be $25,000. You're looking at 4.2 on uh, general provisions? Yeah, 4.2. Four. Four. And, okay. and if it's what we want, that's fine. I'm, I'm fine. Um, with my non-attorney hat, Mr. Layton, um, it's, it's standard sort of cookie cutter, boilerplate language that I'm, I'm accustomed to seeing. And that's about the, the, the best I can speak to it. But in the eight years I've been doing human resources, it's it's um, that's the boilerplate language I'm accustomed to see. So when I read it, I didn't, it didn't stick out to me anyway. Well, there's also boilerplate language. You can say that if there's a dispute and somebody runs to a lawyer, each person pays for their own lawyer. Sure. But, sure. Uh, and I, I, I'm not trying to suggest that, <coughs> that we shouldn't do it. That it's just that, as you call it, boilerplate. Sometimes boilerplates aren't really good. Mm -hmm. They may be. Good for the lawyers, makes work a little easier, but uh, I don't know if there's any side agreements 
that we have in this situation. But there's also, on the next page, something called an integration clause. Mm -hmm. Some people don't even know what that is. But basically, an inter integration clause says, everything that we've decided is in this writing, and nothing else can be considered. Now, maybe for a six or eight or 10 page contract, that might be relatively true, I don't believe it. But if you have a three, three paragraph contract and it says everything's here, uh, and I'm, I'm just, that's the lawyer in me. But uh, again, I'm going to vote yes for it if, if that's what you suggest. But I did want to vote separately. No, I, I appreciate that. and. Uh... I think it's good points. Uh, my recommendation to the board would, would be to go ahead and approve it, but um, certainly good points. Thank you. Any further discussion? Ms. Jensen? Ken? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 And that's for both, correct? Yeah. But, well, we know we're voting for you yeah, exactly. 9.5 and 9.6, they go together. So, in regard to 9.1 through 9.4, um, we, it was a 500 and the same for 9.5 to 96. Uh, moving on to 10.0, personnel services. Uh, and like uh, any other action items um, on the agenda, um, it is recommended. So if the action item is on here, you can assume that the staff has recommended this action item and has vetted it uh, accordingly. It's recommended that the board approve the job description for the assistant superintendent of business services. Uh, Mr. King, can you, um, let's first move it in. I'll move it in. The, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Larry. Can you just elaborate on the, the evolution of this process, basically, how we went from um, yeah. the sure. CFO that we had to this new title and all that? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so a couple of different things. There's a lot of titles in education. When, and for senior level staff positions. In terms of business services, um, there's, an, as we see here, assistant superintendent of business services. There's a chief financial, financial officer, CBO, uh, chief business official, um, deputy superintendent of business. Some of them um, infer a hierarchy. For instance, a deputy superintendent of business would typically be higher than an assistant superintendent of business services. Um, in this case, I, I'll, I'll be uh, totally honest, I went to Ms. David and asked her what she prefers. Uh, not and with excluding deputy, <coughs> because I didn't see a need for a district of uh, our capacity, the work that we have in front of us, for a need for a deputy, just as I don't see a need for an associate superintendent at this point of uh, personnel services, for the same reasons. So the other terms being synonymous, uh, her preference was assistant superintendent of business services. Um, reason being that, um, I'm gonna read kind of my, from my notes actually. So what I have here, just it supports a superintendent by providing overall direction and oversight for the district related to budget, finance, uh, all business services, purchasing facilities and maintenance, child nutrition services, and transportation. Differs from the CFO position, because of the scope is wider and covers a full range of responsibilities related to school business and operations. And I will just expand on that to say additionally, when you look at, for instance, Dr. Raja, somebody who comes through that, that's the, the sort of typical path in business services, it's a very classified path. So classified, maybe they came up through accounts payable, accounts receivable, purchasing, became a supervisor, became a director, became an assistant superintendent, they would probably become a CBO, a chief business official. The route that Ms. David comes with and the background she comes with is actually potentially more beneficial to a district because they have the educational background on top of the business. So Ms. David comes to us, which is actually our next item, but I'll just mention a couple things she, that are pertinent to this um, job description piece, is she comes to us with that wider scope. She has the educational background, she was a teacher, she was a school site principal, and she had the business background, and for those who don't know, she's also an instructor at USC Rossier School of Business. So she, we are fortunate to have her here, and so I respected her opinion in terms of that title. 
Um, it could be deceiving to the public because it looks like, whoa, we got two assistant superintendents. We never had that before. We haven't changed the, the organization uh, at the senior level management positions, and nor have I changed the um, savings that I share with the board and the plan in terms of finances. And for the board's convenience and by uh, one board member's request, we have an organizational chart. I'll consider it in draft form because it was drafted in the last 24 hours. So, but this is our comparison of 1617 to 1718 just to help you in terms of um, your decisions tonight. <coughs> We have extra copies also, you know, for the public and for the media in case you're interested. And, uh, Mr. King, I want to also point out that in the case of, uh, you know, we, we talked at length in regard to Ms. Amanda Fisher and her appointment a while back. And in the case of uh, uh, Ms. Lynn David, she comes from a background of administration and um, um, having basically worn every hat possible in one way or the other in the district. And if we were to kind of pigeonhole her into the title of a CFO, there would be a certain disregard for her background. And I think that this does justice to um, when you consider her full history and what she's done for the district. And also, uh, the way you have it now, and I think it's merited by both parties, is in the, in the case of your retirement, in the case of your departure for any reason, you now have two people that are equally available for that spot. And I think that, I feel that while Ms. Fisher was fully qualified for that position, Ms. David is also equally as qualified. So this, this in, in a way, I think is the correct way, as far as my opinion goes, of doing this. And I think that uh, you've done it the right way. Thank you. Any comments? Um, I, I would, there's three items here. I don't want to make comments on all three and break this up. Can I go ahead? You can go ahead. Thank you. First, and this is a little premature, but Lynn, uh, welcome. and. Um, since I first interacted with you as the only attendee to an LCAP meeting two years ago, I found you to be very competent in, in the world of finances. And most importantly, you take a, a very complicated budget and a very complicated set of criteria that are meant to benefit students. And you're able to relate that to lay people and give them confidence in, in, in you and, and um, and I remember uh, that you and Kim Lytle presented, Ms. Lytle, who was the assistant superintendent at the time, presented comp complicated information in a way that I could understand and, and value. Uh, and, and as far as that goes, I miss what Ms. Lytle, you, would, uh, how she contributed to our team. I really do. So now I'm going to move away uh, from how great Ms. David is, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, our superintendent touched on. I have been very, very resistant to stacking out the top end in this district by adding positions and adding positions. And the main reason for that is we have managed to find ourselves, I sit up here as a fairly new board member, and I'm looking at a 20, at least a 20% dependence on charter schools to build it's actually things. 30%. Okay, his number is even more scary than mine. So we might become lackadaisical and thinking that this money is coming in. So every time I look at something in a position change, I want to see a cost savings associated with that. And remember, it's me, Falls Graph. I'm going to tell you the things that nobody else wants to say sometimes in a way that's very clear. I have actually took it upon myself in the old days to do analysis of other uh, districts in our SALPA, which is a good regional comparison, to say, what does the uh, superintendent make and his support staff in comparison to the number of students they have? And I, I know the bottom line is someone will say, well, there's 10,000 charter students out here. Well, I don't see a, any of them here. And I think short of doing a few site visits and paperwork, that we, we don't contribute meaningfully to the education of t those 10,000 individuals. I think they have people on their sites that do that. So 
Uh, that said, um, my resistance to the assistant superintendent position and adding another one, I think was a matter of nomenclature. And uh, Superintendent King touched on, you can call somebody a deputy director, you can call them a city manager, a city organizer, uh, a deputy director, a director of finance. And so it's just a matter of what you're calling the people. It, to me, what the position means is, what financial liability do I have with this? And when you bring on a new superintendent and a structure, I certainly don't want to see cost increases. I want to see savings that help reduce our dependencies on income sources that can turn out to be volatile in my mind. So when I had questions about this superintendent, they were focused on efficiencies, cost savings, and continuity of service. And so um, sometimes you find people have, uh, feel they have a right to a job, sometimes they're absent for extended periods of time, sometimes the efficiency of the organization is adjusted. In my world as a public servant, I'm a 17-year at-will employee. That means tomorrow morning when I can walk in, they say, Mr. Fallsgraf, hit the door. We don't like your jokes anymore. But my survival in that world depends on my ability to produce positive outcomes for the organization. I think we've transitioned the highest positions in this, in the, in this district to what are the equivalent of uh, exempt positions. Am I right? Correct. So by contract, you, you basically uh, sign for a year of duty, and then we review your performance. So long, long gone are the days of, oh, that's my job, and I'll have it till whenever I want. And we've transitioned to two assistant <laughs> superintendents who have uh, uh, their challenges to pr produce outcomes that are clearly defined and to operate in a way uh, that benefits the district while being economically responsible in that area. Every dollar we save at the top end of this organization is something that reduces our dependency on charter income and makes it more likely that those resources will go back into the classroom. I can, I'm sorry, can you just elaborate a little bit for the public education in regard to the protected positions compared to the contract position? Okay. And what's happened here? So <coughs> that's in the benefit of the district. So, okay, so let me give you an example. How many of you have been watching TV and you saw somebody in Louisiana, cultural and educational capital of the United States, right? I think they're number 51, and I went to school a long time ago, but it struck me there were only 50 states, so I guess there's an island somewhere that's doing better than them. But somebody in that environment gave themselves a $30,000 raise, and a teacher stood up and said, you know what, this is performance-based uh, stuff, so we would give him a set of goals, and then he, he performed, well, he's not, getting, he's not in the classroom. We have been, no, no taking any away from you. But the, the, who, is really, who is really helping that superintendent achieve the goals? Is it not the performance of the students? Is it not the performance of the teachers? And it is, not, is it not the performance of the staff that provide a comfortable and safe environment for the kids who are accomplishing this? But this guy's up here collecting, giving himself a $30,000 bonus with whoever's sitting up here. And so a teacher stands up and says, you know, I used to have 21 students, now I have 29. Uh, I'm in an area where it's kind of difficult. Uh, uh, English language arts, like math, is kind of a challenge in some places. So she expresses her opinion on television in a very calm uh, and civil manner. And the next thing you know, she's being roughed up in the hallway in a pair of handcuffs. And it's just sad, and it speaks to greed. I mean, I think Enron happened, what, 20 years ago? And now some educators are just figuring out where the, where the pot, pot of gold is. I'm really proud that through this reorganization, we've got the accountability that comes with being exempt. If you're exempt and you're not performing your job at the highest level, <coughs> then there's the door and somebody else will come in here. So I applaud the people that are willing to step into that position under those conditions because it's strictly based on your performance. Now the volatilities that come with our district being small and the funding challenges we go through, if something changes, those job descriptions can change, the scope of services can change, and there are a number of things that can change. So I'm happy to see um, this org chart. I, I think it's you know, we're getting down to how things are going to be. We can relax a little bit and know that we got a team in place. 
I'm glad to see the extended absences are gone. We have people in their chairs at work focusing on the district. That's going to take some of the tension away. And I'm relatively sure that someone has been listening to my request is that these costs don't go up in this process of reorganization. Um, how is that for me, Karen? I know this chair is infamous for people that carry on long conversations, so I'm trying to do my part here. Um, so the bottom line is I'll end this with, I don't, uh, uh, I don't care what you call yourself, I don't care what your title is, make yourself happy, um, but I, I, I want to see a cost savings that comes with measure, measurable performance where we can look at somebody and say, you know what, you're doing a slam up job and, and I've got a couple people out there that have stepped up to the plate in the absence of others and helped us get through a rough time. So that's everything I've got on 10.1, 10.3. <gasps> <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Jensen? Yeah, all I want to say is that it is extremely difficult to find someone that has a, a financial and educational background. When you're behind the scenes trying to be a principal or a director or whatever you are in a school district, uh, they are golden. They are hard to find, and so we are very blessed to have someone that has both. Uh, that understands the makings of a school is very difficult when you're trying to work with a budget and you have a person that's great with finance but they don't know anything about what you're, you're trying to order books and all the supplies that you're trying to get to run a school. So, um, very excited for our district. This is, uh, this is great. Thank you, Kelly. Very, very good point. Mike? Yeah, Mike. So, there's really two things uh, that we've all been touching on here. One is this is the completion, uh, the last step of restructuring, a little bit of restructuring that, that came about because of um, all the departures. Superintendent, assistant superintendent, CFO, <coughs> director of maintenance. Uh, and um, if you just count the boxes, there's one less box. Well, what's one, one less? It, it's 10%. So that's, <coughs> that's a significant number. And it's bared out in the numerical cost savings we, we talked about the last vote we had on implementing this new structure. So. 10 plus people, it's less money, and now uh, part of what makes that possible, and it's a pleasure when you find these kind of skills in your district, or right there at home, so to speak, is the individual. And I, I can't say, uh, you, you hit it right on the head, uh, Ms. Jensen, that um, we got a phenomenal person, we've seen those results, um, whether it's been the, through the two budget studies that we've had uh, under your leadership, and they've been excellent, I never really understood our budget as well as I did at the last meeting. Um, the LCF, or the, uh, the LCAP was amazing. So uh, it, it's a pleasure to, to find that you have this and that you can, well, first you get to demonstrate it so you feel comfortable about it. You're not grooming in the blind, but that you can groom it. And uh, welcome to this role. I, I, uh, I'm excited that you're, you're in it. Well, don't welcome her yet. Please. Well, <laughs> you're right. Thank you. Did she smile? Sometimes, <laughs> once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> My I'm only concern tricky. is not for what we do tonight. It's that we, now I won't say perfection, but we've got close to perfection what we're doing tonight. My question is, what if she moves on? And what if they both move on? Is what we're setting up in board policy still good that we would want to have it to, to try to fill later, if we have to? Yeah, my and, I, and I'm not saying that that's a reason to not to do it, because if that did happen, we, all we have to do is come back and change. Yeah. yeah. But it's a great question, great point, because you always have to think of if you're doing something that's precedent setting, good, bad, or indifferent, you have to look towards the future and, and be thinking in that manner. So it's a great, great point. Um, I, I think we're, we're, we're setting up a, a cabinet and a, a schema and a model that is good for the district. You know, you have to step back and always look at what is the best thing for our students. That's always my mantra in my head anytime I'm making a decision um, about anything in education, is what is best for our students. And I think the model that we're, we're trying to put in place 
is best for our students. Um, if one of them uh, were to move on, um, first of all, I, I never hold somebody back. They are both marvelous individuals, so is the, the lady sitting next to me. And if, if any of one on, on our team were to decide to do something else, I always encourage people to go after their passion and their dreams and, and what they want to do, so I never would hold somebody back. But if that happened, uh, we are set up that we can refly the position, repost it in, in any manner we want. To, to Mr. Falligroff's point, uh, these positions have a lot of flexibility when you talk about being exempt positions, uh, management positions. We can, we can post it with a salary window. We can post it you know, with a range. We're not knowing if somebody is at the caliber necessarily of maybe a $160,000 salary. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility we have in that regard. And, and I'm, I'm confident that the board will have that uh, moving forward should we be in that scenario. But if we had to go back to somebody that's only half was a CFO, <coughs> that would be possible very easily. Easily. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. Well, you're going to have my vote of yes for two things. That it's a good procedure that we're setting up the assistant superintendent of business services and the excellent, excellent qualified person involved. Ms. David, the two um, last uh, uh, budget study sessions, I know we have one coming up that, that you headed. Me and Mike were commenting to our, each other that uh, they were two of the best that we had. And you do have a great passion for your job. And I really commend you for being a great team member in the last uh, few months, which you've basically done both the principalship at the High Desert and your job, uh, your current job. And uh, it's, uh, it's rare that we have someone like that, and I really appreciate having you on the, on, on the team. And, um, you know, I look forward to seeing you, um, your contribution to our financial culture, you know, because I do think that, like some of the things we talked about in closed session, I do think that there's a lot of work we gotta do. And I do have, uh, like Ken does, uh, uh, reservations, and uh, I do worry about uh, the dependence that we have on about nearly 30% of our income coming from a source that's out of our control. Mm -hmm. That doesn't fall within LCAB and LCFF, and that's our charters. So I do have concerns about that. Uh, and hopefully we can get to a point where, um, you know, uh, we have a more viable um, financing method. You know? So I, I, I was on the board when we had no charters at all. Anyways, so any further discussion? All right, uh, call the question. Aye. 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 That's 10.1. That's 10.1, right. yeah. Congratulations. Great. Um, and 10.2? I'll move that. All right. Any second for 10.2? Second. Thank you, Larry. Any discussion? A couple uh, comments on the contract, just to be transparent. Yeah. I want to uh, state the terms of the contract. The date record. also. Yes. Um, so this is a two-year contract beginning January 16th, commencing on June 30th, 2019. There was an error on the um, attachment, just uh, for full disclosure, and it was uh, December 17th, I believe. December 2017. It was a. That's a placeholder that, that is left in place just so that we know we need to fill in the blank, December blank, 2017. Right. But there was never an intention of retroactive compensation or anything like that. So if anybody read that in the public, it's just a placeholder. So we can't actually, I wouldn't in good conscience, put them into place until the previous CFO's resignation was effective date. January 15th. So you got 15th. 16th is the new first day of January 16th. Correct. Um, the salary is $159,762. One day of sick day per month in the accrual uh, for sick leave. 12 months of full and regular service. Uh, it's a 225 day duty calendar work days, 15 vacation days, and what they call 240 service days. Um, $4,000 to be uh, uh, used towards health and welfare benefits. Anything above and beyond that would be of the employees, uh, uh, out of the employee's pocket. That's a standard employee contribution, correct? Correct, okay. And 
just uh, some personal comments about Ms. David. Uh, she stepped up to the plate at a critical time, and I know you all know that. Um, I was new on the job a few weeks in, and uh, Dr. Rudraja, uh, we always say, I always say family first, and he needed to take care of whatever he needed to, uh, so, so uh, I'm understanding of that. But being new to the district, with charter schools, first interim, uh, audit actuals, and so on and so forth, the budget cycle, uh, tough time to, to come in without a, a, a CBO. And so she stepped into that. We also, if you remember, had a vacant assistant superintendent of personnel services at that time as well. So I was trying for a short time to balance uh, three, and I did ask uh, Ms. David to step up and, and assist in that role, and she graciously did, uh, not knowing what the future held, and also at the same time balanced out her duties and responsibilities at High Desert as best she could. And it's been <coughs> tremendous working with you. You are a marvelous individual, and I'm so thankful and happy to have you on the team. I'm going to use Mr. Porter's words, preemptively, of course, uh, pending board approval. Uh, welcome home. He said that to me when I was uh, hired, and I'm going to say that to you, even though you've been here longer than me. And I drive 75 miles each way, and I get to go home twice a day. So, um, so I say welcome home. Okay, any further discussion? Board members? All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Am, am I allowed to say, I know I'm not supposed to speak out of here, but I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and the support you've given me. It's, um, it's been fun <coughs> being here at the site. It's actually really hard because I know that that's going to mean a transition of, you know, from the people that I've loved and worked with and the kids and everything, and I still plan to visit. but. Um, I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to helping you out any way I can. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on to 10.3, resolution 17-18.9, to designate the position of Assistant Superintendent of Business Services as Senior Management. This is what Ken was talking about. Taking the position from a protected position to contracted position that's exempt. Uh, Mr. Falstrap moved this. I'll second it. And all in favor, aye. 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 11.0, business and financial, 11.1, public hearing, method K through 8, slash 9 through 12, charter school petition, material revision. I'm going to open the hearing at uh, 8.44. And I'm going to ask, uh, oh, I don't know if you were going to introduce it. Uh, yeah, I want to introduce no. Ms. Uh, so with us tonight is Method. They have two charters with us, the K-8 and the 9-12, and they're here to do a material revision to share with us about combining that together. So we have Mark Holly and Jessica Spolino. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I think we're pulling up the presentation yes. right now. Um, we delivered the petition and then our plan for the site at the last meeting um, for your review. So I'm just going to kind of go over the two main material revisions in the charter petition and go over our plan for the Shasta ruling for our site, which is in Arcadia, LA County. So, um, so we'll go ahead and start with just a few updates on the organization. We're in our third year of operation. Um, I'm a little lost about the slide, unfortunately. <laughs> um, just go over a few key items. Um, our ADA growth since opening, thank you, is um, up to 290, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, our academic growth, we have, uh, obviously we participate in required state testing, but we also do internal diagnostic and benchmark testing. So we chart students growth there, and we're seeing growth there in a, in a way that we're very excited about. Um, our ADA growth, most of it is due to a, um, growing partnerships that we have with uh, school districts throughout Southern California. And they send their students to us for our track A program. So they send our, our students just for our, with, for their summertime, but our track A. Um, and last summer, I think we ended up serving for LA? Oh, for LA, about 2,200. About 2,200 students for our summer program. 
Um, so uh, through that, we've, we've developed a lot of partnerships with schools and districts and have kind of bridged that divide between charter schools and um, public school districts. So we're very proud of that. That number is getting close to about 170. We're now in, in mode of preparing for this coming summer. We already have 11 new schools that are, that are on. So that number is continuing to grow as we network with more schools throughout Southern California. Um, we also have, in the past, we've uh, relied on vendor curriculum. And we have, and vendor student information systems. And um, since we have developed our own, so we've been um, working very hard on this project <coughs> of creating our own student information system and our own learning management system with our own content. So we're going off of the vendors and doing this in-house, um, and we're starting to implement that now. Uh, we're, we're piloting it now with a school district and with our own students in preparation for a big summer um, program. So we're very excited about that. It's a, a very um, big piece of our program right now that we're very excited about. Um, so the, the petition um, addresses two, two main things. Um, the first part is uh, the K and high school. We have two separate charters to maximize our revenue for startup funding. Um, and we've merged that together. Um, since we no longer can maximize the revenue, uh, it's just creating double work. So we're doing double reports. It's very complicated with the two, with the two charters. So what we'd like to do is merge those into one. Uh, the petition that you have basically just merges any, any um, inference to the K-8 and the 912 are now all just K-12. Um, and then the, the other part of it is in relation to the Shasta ruling and our, our site being out of compliance. So now phase one of that was submitting the waiver to the CD and we did and that was approved. So as of now the site in Arcadia is in compliance due to the approval of the waiver. Um, and we're going to go ahead and skip the phase two of the exemption since that isn't required. We want to merge the Caden High School and then I'll explain our ongoing plan for our Arcadia site after this school year. So I just talked about this. This was the, the reason for the K-912 and why we're merging them now. Um, and the school would then just become Method LA. Uh, upon approval of the merge, we would then just submit for a new CDS code for the March CDE board, me board meeting and get all of that finalized for a 7-1 to just be a single school. And then the operating plan for the Arcadia site is um, it's a kind of a homeschool online only program. So um, 85 to 90% of our ADA right now is for online students that we serve. Um, so we would, with that, or the plan for the site is just to be a full homeschool online center. So students are not there on site each day for instruction. So I, what I'm hearing is since it's already 85 to 90%, exactly. it's not a big deal to make the transition to 100%. Precisely. Yep. Um, so the, the center that we currently have will be proposed to be office space that houses our online teachers and any sort of administrative staff that's needed there. Um, we have some curriculum writers that are, that are helping to develop our curriculum content that can work there as well and do at times. Um, and we like having that site there. It helps kind of generate um, a place for summer school students to come and get some support with their online enrollment they need to come in and, and, and see people in person. Um, and then in July 2019, a year from this summer, we'll go ahead and reassess where we're at and if we need to pursue any different changes. But that's the plan for this coming year after the um, waivers, the approval is, is out, of, out of date. And that is it. So any of the changes within the petition address two things. It's the K and the, and the 912 merged together. And then the, any inference in the petition that refers to students on site or master schedule or anything, any of that now refers to an online school, home school where they're not coming on site. So those are the only changes that would be, have been made in that petition. Any questions? Um, Mr. King, uh, with your permission, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Fisher for any comment. Uh, Absolutely. 
Any comments? So, good? so at the next board meeting we have, you'll get my full vetted of okay. this material revision. So this is just her opportunity, their opportunity, to present this to you, and then after that, I will give you the full vetted. Yes. So I'll buy the heavy. Um, so I see having the Arcadia address helps you with the summer school. Does that mean that the summer school is allowed to have students then come in? No, I, I'm just for enrollment process. Just for enrollment. Because we have, you know, thousands of students okay. who enroll during that time. So it's, so it's great it's for them a, to be able to come and drop off documentation if they're not comfortable with scanners or, you know, that sure. sort of thing. Or so just for to help them enroll. Thank you. Yes. I have a couple. If you don't, if you're not expected to answer them right now. Um, I have a couple that are more um, observations. I remember when ADA came in here and when Eagle Collegiate came in here, and there were substantial uh, parts of their program that were strictly online. The, this board tended to tear them apart for two hours. I don't see that type of resistance tonight. I'm not sure why. Um, we granted this, this charter a waiver to just address the sta Shasta issues. Did, as part of that remedy, did this program approach where the, dis where the, where the facility and the students are actually located and seek uh, and petition them to sponsor this school. We haven't. Yeah, we partner closely with Arcadia. Um, they send students to uh, catch up on credit, things like that. Um, we do have a good relationship with the district, but it, it, it's a kind of a superfluous thing. We didn't. Ninety percent of our revenues are generated online. Our online students do well. Um, they beat kind of our targets. So they don't think you're using online, but it's not. The online school that got popular five to ten years ago. It's a very uh, kind of uh, immersive online program. These kids are going to college, doing well. And because 90% of this revenue is coming from online, there wasn't a real need to go to Arcadia. That's kind of we pivoted our, our plan uh, based on that. Um, just, you know, for 10% of our revenues, it wasn't, it wasn't worth it at that point. So that's, we did not approach them about authorizing. Um, but we, they're very aware we're there, and I think they're grateful we're there because they send 400 kids to us a year. So. But we don't send 400 kids a year from this district to you, do we? No, we don't. So historically, just throw a number at me. How many students from this district have participated in your program, either through a site or through online? I couldn't give you a number off the top of my head. I can look in our system. It's it's lower than that just because of size and because of distance um, from our center. Um, but it is something that we've talked about. Um, we have made inroads north of here, uh, Palmdale and Lancaster, and so I think this would be kind of another extension of that. So, so my question is, two questions. Did you approach where most of your student body is located? Because I'm not a believer in just saying, Okay, those of you that need the support of a resource center or, and again, these are things that were discussed and thrown at Einstein in the beginning when we did with them, they got run through the ringer on this. Uh, how do you take a kid that's used to the support of a resource center and just by punching in online in every sentence, it, how many of these kids do well online? How many of them uh, are gonna make this transition? Because I don't really see there is no transition. Um, most yeah. kids are already online. Um, I was a business administrator of the district for years, and back then when online schools came in, it was kind of a, a trend, I guess, and it was a fad. It isn't that way anymore. Um, the, the way things work now, we have athletes, um, we have professional motocross athletes, and all sorts of different students who a traditional school is not a fit for them. We're not a home school that pays parents to Know, vouchers to do their own thing. It's all inclusive. Um, so the kids, what percentage of these kids are going to transition well? Well, they already have. They're already going online with us. And they do well. As far as trying to locate a center that's near our kids, 
Uh, we serve students from basically every city in Southern California between our different charters. This charter here would be pretty spread out. Um, we originally intended to um, locate near kind of this area in Arcadia, and what we found is online has made it kind of popular for a lot of kids um, all over the place. And so we definitely looked at kind of clusters of kids that we can you know, pick up in geographic areas. But what we found is that we're just really popular throughout Los Angeles. County, so. Okay, so the next thing I want to ask you about, if you go to page five of your petition, um, this is a material vision, correct? Correct. We should probably label it that way. We go into page five of your of your uh, petition and looking at the ADA, we're we're starting from nine students to seventy three, and we're seeing a, a between the time we granted your waiver and now a seven fold increase in your um, in your ADA in the high school level, but the lower end the numbers are still floating around. Are those individual students, or are those <coughs> thousands of students, or? So the ADA, that's a good observation that I think, um, I'm glad you, you mentioned so we can talk about it. The K through eight school is by far the most impacted by the Shasta resolution, by far. We can serve students online at this point much easier in the upper grades than we can in the lower grades. And so that growth has not been there because we don't you know, have this, the facility open for those kids. Um, what we're working on now with the online curriculum that we've developed is working projects into that, which is kind of our next phase, so that we can attract online students in their younger grades. But right now, though, that K through eight growth isn't there, and then you can blame it on that uh, Shasta resolution. But I noticed, like in K through three, that this is an average. There's not a, a half a kid out there. But are we talking about 2.59 thousand or 2.59 students? You're talking about 2.59 students in that grade. And so we jump up, our growth in that is to five last year. The next grade is, it, there's actually a decrease of two students. And then there's a doubling in grade seven to eight. But what it, to be honest with you, what it looks to me like is, with the Shasterling, with the higher end, we took the fragments of the pieces we had out here and collectively all brought them to here because we're most likely to approve you. Would that be uh, a fair assumption? Well, I, I think, I'm not sure if I understand, but I... Well, if I've got, let me make it clear. If I've got 200 students online here and 400 over here, it's really easy for me just to program the computer so when you log in, you just go over here now and over here. What this looks to me like a seven-fold increase doesn't say that the program is really successful. Uh, if if I were to tell the superintendent, I'm going to sevenfold your in, your your enrollment here next year financially, we might be jumping up and down. But the first thing that would pop into my mind is where where are the teachers? Where's the support staff? Where's that? So, I guess what I'm asking you, I'm asking you, is did you have five or six programs and the Shasta really forced those all to come together so you brought them to us? Or what criteria caused your enrollment to increase sevenfold in a period of a year? Strictly organic growth, as we noted, there are no consolidations. We've never merged with one other school. Uh, we work very closely with school districts. Um, we don't fight with school districts over ADA, over ADA. We work closely with them, and that's been a huge reason for it. When they send their student to Method, that student gets a WASC accredited, UC approved, NCAA approved online course. No other online school in California offers that. So they send their kids to us. They don't even offer that, the school districts go. So they send their students to us. Those students come back ready um, to graduate, go to college, things like that. And so they're coming to us strictly through quality product, we believe. It's all organic, there is no merge. And as we've gotten more popular, we've gotten to the point where we've had to look at some capping because it is difficult to, murder, to go from you know, 50 kids to 1,000 kids, it's, it takes some time. So to take that to the next step, would you say that there's been some increase in your enrollment to help me understand where these kids are coming from, that other uh, uh, offerings or other systems have shut down due to Shasta and people looking for the type of service your school offers uh, 
might be coming in and enrolling in, in, in your program as an alternative to maybe their school closing? Uh, possibly, but I would say unlikely just because uh, most of our growth is high school and they're not coming to us because of a Shasta situation. We do pick up some students from other schools, but I'm unaware of students coming to us because the school closed as much as they just don't like that school. Um, and the charter school industry is difficult. The inherently, you have more <coughs> mobility just because the fact a parent wants to put their kids in a charter school to begin with um, tells you that they're kind of open to moving their kid around. And we deal with that uh, reality every day. Um, but we've been fortunate um, over the last few years to build a staff in that kind of gets that. And I think being close to the parents and being close to the districts that we work kind of in that ecosystem with has made the difference um, for us. Would you say that knowing that uh, approximately half of the high school students in California do not meet proficiencies in math and English, would you say that your program offers, that some of your growth is, because there's an inherent dropout rate that's, that's possibly fueling that, would you say that that would help increase your the attractiveness of your enrollment? Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. Uh, what we offer, even though it's online and you know there are some, some um, I think, you know, if there's some confusion around how it works, we tried to include it in the petition. I've added a lot of the information around the standards that we align to in online learning. Um, we've been in kind of the online learning space for almost 15 years, so the teachers that we employ have done it for many, many years. There, there's a level of standards that they all adhere to that, that have been determined by IME Call and SD and all of those organizations. And so what we specialize in is very personalized one-on-one -on -one learning, even in a virtual environment. And so how that looks is one-on-one -on -one virtually, but also we assess them regularly with our internal diagnostic assessment. And that charts them in the, state, the Common Core standards and prepares them for state tests and their courses, all of that. So it's very, very personalized, highly personalized, very individualized. A lot of the curriculum is prescriptive based on their assessments. So it's very data driven. So we're able to do, and that in this environment, it, it does have its challenges for sure. But it also gives us, affords us some tools and vehicles to actually make it very personalized, even more so than they may be getting in a scene-based situation. Would you say that you going to your own curriculum, your internally provided curriculum system, has reduced your cost uh, to back up house operations that you may not have direct control over? That's, that's what a political exactly, question. Huh? <laughs> that's exactly what I was saying. I can see kind of what where your impact is with that um, with charter schools. I think the issue that we've had is when we poll our students and our parents constantly, um, whether it's net promoter score, or just basic customer service uh, surveys. What we found is they didn't like whatever curriculum we went to. They didn't really like it. Um, it was was built by large companies um, that what wasn't for them. So what we did is we built, took a long time and we needed to build our own LMS, our own learning management system to host it. And it took a long time. But what we found is that that attracted, not only attracted students, but it gave us that flexibility to you know, not only um, have curriculum that was right size for our students, but we could control the costs. Um, online curriculum, it, when I first, and Jessica's been doing this longer than me, but when I first bought my first online curriculum at a school district, um, they could charge whatever they wanted because it was, whatever it was, it was less than brick and mortar. It just isn't that way anymore. And so to get, just to answer the question, we'll spend about eight, maybe 10% this year, um, starting next school year, I'm sorry, on curriculum um, of what we were. So, it, you know, it's, it's you know, a 90% decrease in cost, basically. And okay, it enables us to personalize even more. We really <coughs> build in tools that make it far we're, more personalized. We're getting really <coughs> close here. Um, is there any performance data that you have that we could look at? Because I know that when you have kids coming in and going out, it, but, but I would appreciate some performance data, Amanda. The mobility also, rate makes it tough, but we have yeah plenty of data we can share. Cool. Um, Amanda, as usual, I'll expect the official attorney's statement on this, this charter to come to your recommendation. Um, uh, to frame what just happened here, I, I'm very 
just right to the point. What I don't want to see happening here is the can being kicked down the road and we maintain our reputation of go to them, they'll sponsor anyone. So I think the questioning I put you through is kind of like it doesn't appear to me that you're just bunching up your stuff from somewhere else where you're getting no's and just bringing them to us uh, just regardless to keep things running and, and you, you uh, from what you're saying, it appears to me that you, you have a genuine interest in the performance of your students and I'd like to see that performance data. So thank you for my pa your patience and my direct questions. Thank you. I, I, you know, it's not really a question for you, but, uh, a new question. The reason I specifically asked um, and clarified that you're already 80 to 5 to 90 percent online, so when you make the transition, you know, it's only 10 percent of those students that are you at risk, uh, that you may be at risk of losing. The reason, uh, and I'm just alluding to Ken, I'm sure you didn't I mean it. Um, Antag antagonistically. Are you but, sure? Well, okay. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. When me and one other board member grilled poor Maggie for two hours as it related to Einstein, that's, it was precisely because in that situation, the revision was going from a seat-based school that was extraordinarily popular to an experiment to some extent of moving that population into a um, into a blended learning environment, <coughs> and those questions, that line of questioning, was uh, to try to justify some of the financial assumptions that were being made in the success of that transition. I am now, and I'm, and now I'm, and and, and doing that, moving from a high school where 100% of the kids were physically there in the city of Valencia to a hybrid at a house in an elementary school and some trailers in an elementary school <coughs> in Agua Dulce. And so really that whole line of questioning was only, and the reason I put poor Maggie who's sitting there through the ringer is because when we're assessing, which we haven't gotten to yet, the financial viability the assumptions that are behind that, that those viability assessments are key. And it's not unfathomable to say, gee, you're really going to kind of hit those numbers um, that you're assuming. And I'm not suggesting you have or haven't. Okay? And, and the fact that there's a letter coming has nothing to do with it. I'll learn that next time. But in your case, and to your point, Ken, the reason my questioning, rather than taking an hour or two, took five minutes is because in your case you're making a transition where already 85 to 90 percent of your student body that's currently enrolled and happy is not seeing a change and so so that so I just want to you know it's not like it was being unfair or segregating out poor Einstein for a couple of hours of questioning so that that's all and we have, in the petition, I have included a couple new positions we've hired to even support that 10%. We hired a homeschool coordinator. We hired these levels of support that kind of enhance that online time. Um, just to make it a little more um, Easy engaging and community-based, even continue. though it's not on the site. Mm -hmm. So we Thank will you. try to fill in with that as well. Have you any other questions yes. uh, Mr. Latham? No, I don't have any questions. Is, is, is this what I have is current, what you gave me last time? Yes. Okay, because I do have some questions, but since they're just giving their information, Amanda, do I just, as you're betting, do I just talk to you? Would that be easier? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Unless okay. Well, no, it's just in. some of the standards and things are just, they're outdated. You talk about self-testing. We no longer self-test in the state of California, your EL students and things such as that. Okay, so you have some, um, I'm concerned yeah. about when you're addressing California state standards, you're, you're talking about, um, you have old language in here, so I want to make sure that your students or our students are being able to um, have a rigorous instruction, and I see some language in here, and when I see old standards and old testing for our EL students, I'm concerned that you're not really meeting the standards that our students need to, to meet. So. Yeah, I feel like it's slightly an oversight during the updating, so I can address any of those. 
Yeah, you, I can just give you a couple of examples yeah. so you can go back and, and look, because um, I have several. You talk about um, self-testing like I talked about, which is outdated. We use LPAC now, and, and I'm concerned that if you don't know what that is, you missed the, the first training, how you're going to assess students. Um, there's one coming in April, so I'd suggest you look at that and make sure that your, your staff is well trained. Um, you talk about um, you talk about um, mastering uh, science standards when we're talking about NGSS standards now, Common Core. You talk about math standards, and we should be talking about the, the new the new Common Core standards, California Common. Just things we're, like that. Yeah, so I just it's, it's want to make sure that we're um, that your curriculum is meeting the needs of the students and mm -hmm. and you're addressing the current standards. Yep, we we're, we're aligned all of that. So yeah, all of data. Yeah. Oh, great. Is that it, Kelly? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Jensen, thank you very much. And I think, again, as you did at our first meeting when we had the budget study session, you displayed your level of expertise. You know, and we're lucky to have you on the board. Um, my only comment would be I'm going to um, correspond in regard to this with Amanda. Um, my only comment would be it doesn't have to do with you guys, it has to do with Ken just said that, you know, we have a reputation of go to them and they'll approve anyone. Facts don't, facts don't show that, with all due respect. We've had 36 applications and we have 14 charters, so I just wanted to put that out there, but I know what he's saying. There's uh, certain perceptions out there, but that's not the fact. And uh, uh, also, as in regard to Einstein, uh, I was one of the three board members <coughs> who supported their provisional material revision and at the time, I felt that we had a partnership, and we did put them to through rigorous questioning. But uh, I felt that they deserved, they deserved a chance at least for a year to prove themselves, and I hope that they do in the coming week. And that things are good for them. Um, I I did have a couple of questions for you guys, real quick. Um, I went through your website um, earlier today, and. Uh, um, you basically, you make uh, references in there that for each student, uh, you can have a teacher available if, uh, if needed, okay? And I just wanted to just ask you, in general, let's say, first of all, how many students do you have in total? Well, this year, at the current, I mean, ADA-wise, we're, we're at, for this chart, about 340. Okay, great. Between how the two combined. Okay, so 340 students. How many teachers do you have available for them? Well, we're a 25 to 1 ratio. Excellent. So we're, actually, we're going to lower than that. We're probably 20 to 1. So, so I'm, I'm a student. I'm online. I'm doing my thing, right? And I have a need for a teacher for a certain subject. How would that process work? So they're all assigned a, 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 like a mentor teacher that's on their caseload, and they monitor everything and make sure they get all the interventions and instructional support they need. So if they needed a, a virtual session or somewhere to meet off-site to get instructional support, they would get that scheduled through their, their assigned caseload teacher, and they would get their corresponding subject area of instructional support. So some, some students will meet in small groups based on common deficiencies. Some meet based on requests. Some were required to attend virtual instructional sessions based on performance. So it's a variety of instructional support sessions they would get. Is there a situation when the student might need too much tutoring and that student would be asked to leave your organization? Is there anything like that? No. <laughs> There's nothing like that. Uh, to no. ask to leave? Does anything come to mind, any instance come to your mind that that might have happened? We, I mean, not that we're aware of. I mean, the only, the only thing you could speak of would be like special ed situations, I guess. As far as like, General ed students, there are no issues where parents or students come to us and they need more than they can take that. In fact, most don't. You know, both that we would love that because the more touch points they have, the better they're going to do. Um, and then for a general ed student and for a special ed student, it's just a matter of whatever their IEP says. And we always follow that. So. Okay, no further questions. I'm going to close this hearing at 9.15. And I look forward to uh, Amanda's uh, report on this. and. Uh, to include our, <coughs> our legal staff's opinion. Thank, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to 11.2, our audit report by Christy White Associates. We're going to open the hearing at uh, 9.16. I'm just going to have Ms. David come up so she can make an introduction, Mr. President. Okay, and I will be brief.
I know it's getting late, so I will just do a brief introduction of our auditor. And um, I want to thank um, Valerie Shaw for coming. She is the lead auditor. There was an actually team. They come in several times in the year, and they give us a list of items. And I have to say that they're actually all actually crazy. So set up. Um, they're actually really wonderful to work with. I've had the opportunity to work with several audit firms over over times, so and I think even at a school site they come in, and they're really they are really wonderful in providing a list of what we needed, so that we could be as efficient on both ends as possible. Um, they were really great about it. if they had a question about something they said, um, you know, they clarified. And I have to say, she was amazing when I said, I don't even know what some of this stuff is, you know, because um, I had a, you know, a much bigger team in my prior district. And I said, I don't even know what this is. And so she was very patient. And in one occasion, you know, I said, I got to pull this information together. I got to, I'm scratching to find it. So they are very patient, and I will turn it over to her to let you speak about the process. And I'm not sure if you've actually had the auditor present before. Um, I know that you usually get the audit report every year, but I wanted to bring her in so you could have an opportunity to the auditor herself about um, our results. As Ms. David said, I'm Valerie Shaw. I'm the director in charge of your audit, and I've been with Christy White for quite some time now, and I've been with the auditor for, I believe, five years now. Um, this audit report that we've completed was through the year end June 30, 2017. So obviously we're six months ago now, but uh, this audit was much better than the year before. We took it from five findings in the 2015-16 year down to just two findings for this report. So it's great improvement. Um, Ms. David was super helpful in getting all the information. I know most of it came under Dr. Duraja's watch, so it was hard for her, I'm sure, to try and find his filing systems and get us all the information we needed. But what we have is a, a great audit report, very minor findings, like just a couple of state compliance items. So overall great. The process that we go through, typically we come out three times a year. So we'll come out in early spring, right about this time, we go visit your school site. So we sample some of your school sites. We'll look at the attendance records and the uh, ASB accounting records and make sure that everything's processing and happening the way it should. And then we also, in the spring, visit the district office where we look at the district controls. So we actually dig into the payroll controls and the accounts payable and the receiving and all of that. And then we come back in the fall and that's where we actually finalize the report and we get all the data that we need for that. So it's it's definitely a process and we work very hands on with the district. And as she said, we want to make sure that we're communicating, we understand when we ask you for something that you don't just say, oh, we don't do that and we move on and we write a finding. We, we talk it through and make sure that it's as we're expecting it to be. So overall, great report. Um, I don't think there's anything too different from what we've had in the past in this report. Going forward, you will see some changes with regard to the OPEB, which is your other post-employment benefits, so your retiree health care that you paid for. Um, so there will be some changes with regard to that due to a new standard that's coming out for that. But we will help the district in implementing that and making sure that all the information that's needed gets conveyed. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I have one. Um, I I, I'm an ops guy, so I don't understand, you know, I understand my budget, but not some of this stuff. Um, in, in the first finding, with regard to um, classroom teacher salaries, what impact does the uh, level of uh, charter income that we have being weighed into our budget affect that finding? Um, it shouldn't impact it too awfully much. What we're looking at here and what the, the calculation entails is to compare the total expenditures and to see what portion of your expenditures are actually being spent on teacher salaries. And there's a basic minimum that's required for a unified district to meet. And unfortunately, for the last two years, your district has fallen short of that required minimum. But it's basically, you're looking at a criteria that would be comparable to any school district and the funding that goes to uh, the students and, and all that in the district, right. the ADA so, funding. Yeah, okay. so, so the, the amount that we're looking at and what we're concerned with is the actual teacher's salaries, what goes to the classroom salaries for teachers. And that has to do with, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, perhaps was, was uh, under, misunderstood. So I know that we've, we've fallen under the threshold before, and I know that we've uh, filed paperwork in the county as said, okay. Um, but it was my understanding, I want to understand if I'm mistaken, that um, it, it, 
in our case, where money comes in associated with charter schools and money goes out associated with charter schools, and then that and that that inflow and outflow can be a relatively larger portion of our overall ins and outs. It was my understanding that perhaps the reason we had partially fallen under the threshold is because what we're counting in the outflow is the portion that's going to our teaching staff relative to the to 100% of outflow. And therefore, if we have this other spigot coming in and out, right. that that might throw off our ratio And side. it's definitely possible that that's, that's playing a oh. role in this. Okay. You Thank weren't you. too far off of what the required percentage was. So okay. It's, so, it's but if, so then if we do have a larger spigot coming in and spigot going out, it's possible that could throw us over those thresholds. Right. That's okay. Right. I just wanted to be clear. That's Thank a you. very good point, Mike, mm -hmm. and it's important to remember nearly 90, 90%, 88% of mm -hmm. our uh, outflow of our budget goes to the staff. So, you know, almost nine-tenths of what we spent goes in pay from either our teachers or our certificates. So that's important to understand. But what Mike just explained, that's what the reason for that discrepancy is. And that's the reason why, yeah, why, uh, you know, uh, we've been allowed to do that. Any, any other questions?
provided for from our fund 40. And this is for our phase three. And I'm very happy to move this in. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Larry. Okay, let's have discussion on this. This is a biggie. This is, we know this is something that was uh, uh, in the works for a long time. I want to commend the board for, for having the foresight uh, from a financial perspective to, to look ahead and keep those funds well and alive in the reserve so you can um, see your, your uh, sort of dream come to fruition in terms of facilities. So I want to just review a little bit. Board of Trustees approved uh, going out for a bid for the construction of the athletic fields at Vasquez High School. This approval included the base bid as well as three additive alternatives, which are in the next agenda item. It was a notice and publicly advertised as required by law. Uh, mandatory job walk was conducted. Sealed bids were publicly opened on December 12th. Five bids were received. Our facilities team evaluated all the bid packages and United Construction was selected as the lowest uh, bid. Um, the awarding of the bids in, this, in these items as well as the next item which contains the bid alternate, alternatives, alternates. Um, actually, before we go farther, I do want to introduce our team. Pardon me. Uh, so we have, of course, Ms. David. This is our facilities team that meets about every two weeks, sometimes weekly. Uh, we have Jim Vos. Appreciate everything you've done, and you've been here long, much longer than I have. And I appreciate everything you've done to get me up to speed. John Tigmeyer, he's with the architectural firm. Uh, Mike Rona, who I've introduced to the board in uh, prior board meetings. Mr. Rona's here, and, and he's been key and integral, and as the uh, standard in our district, uh, filling in for what was previously the director of uh, maintenance and operations. And his facilities ex expertise has been uh, very valuable through, through the process. Um, we're gonna we're gonna before I ask uh, before you ask your questions. I talked about the celebration piece. It's a little bit I don't want to say bitter bittersweet maybe because there's tough decisions to be made. I just want to encourage the board to listen carefully, um, be open minded, ask the thoughtful questions you've been asking tonight, just like you did through the charter piece. Um, and I say that because when you look at 11.5, even though we're not on that agenda item right now, Ms. Davis is going to share some things through the finances that we want to be careful. And um, I think being conservative in this regard is my recommendation to the board. Uh, Ms. Davis is going to go into detail on that. But I'm, I'm in favor and strongly recommend moving forward with 11.4. Um, going to ask the board to consider strongly rejecting potentially 11.5. You may have other thoughts as the discussion proceeds and you have a wealth of information and knowledge among our team here. Feel free to ask your questions to them as we go through it. But Mr. President, those are just, just kind of my thoughts, uh, pre preemptory thoughts. I tend to agree with you exactly. Yes, do we have any other written materials that we're going to be considering this evening? Yes, we do. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. David to, to kind of go over Yeah, what, um, what you should have, I think that you just got counted, there was a summary. And just to kind of clarify, um, and this is something that Jim Bose prepared for us. Uh, on the, how shall I So a couple, a couple of things um, to keep in mind is, um, what, as we discussed before, what funded the high school so far, the construction, was Fund 21, which was our bond that the community passed. Those funds are fully expended, down to literally zero dollars now. So the funds that we do have available currently are uh, $2,300,000, a little bit over that, $2,300,000. Um, available in Fund 35, which were the matching funds from the state. So that is the amount of money that we have available that is targeted specifically for baskets. So keeping that in mind, what you should have in your hand now is a table. And on the, look at the far right hand first, because that's really talking about the base bid. The base bid um, includes, in summary, um, the softball field, the concession stand, the track. 
We're only on page. Yeah, this one over on this right hand. We don't have that. We don't have that. You don't have to yeah. I think we're missing something for what you've got. Or, or, yeah, that's all. Okay. So you're that's describing all. what's in yeah, here. Yeah, I'm describing what's oh. in here. Okay. Yeah, just so you guys are clear and you guys may jump in. Yeah, if I, there's another page. That yeah, no, no. More. I'm just, just so people know what's included in the base yeah. bid. In the base bid um, includes the softball diamond, the concession stand, a walking track, um, and then the grading associated. <laughs> That's the construction part of it. There's also, as you see on here, what they call soft costs. So construction are the hard costs. Soft costs, when you hear us talk about, that relates to all the um, services and fees. And I don't know if you guys have a better way to describe that, but it's basically the services and fees that are required. Things like your, your um, inspector for your soils, the people who inspect the actual work on site, your actual um, de department of the state architect, um, DSA inspector who is on site making sure that things are done and will pass in the end. So the total cost, if you look to the far right hand side, because that's actually just for the base bid, the cost for the estimated cost, well actually the cost of the, um, the bid we got for the construction plus the soft cost is um, $2,290,633. So that actually is the amount of money that we have, a little bit more. So that's why we feel comfortable recommending that as um, to accept that bid. We do have the funds for that and the bid came in. Our um, consultants did, did follow up to make sure that they were a responsible bidder, that they had all the bonding and such. And I don't know if you guys want to add anything with the process or something I've missed, because again, I'm coming into this project a little bit, you guys have been on it for a while. We, we did look into their background, and we've actually worked with them previously, so I can go into more detail. No, and their pleasure. We're, we're, you know, we guys are for <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> okay, so um, that, that is our recommendation. Now, the part that I think is a little bit confusing for people in general is when we talk about the bid alternate, um, or the additive alternates, and I know that that's really the next item, but just to get the big picture and wrap our heads around it. When it went out to bid, the way it was advertised, so the base bid was the softball field. Then we could, the alternates are a whole nother piece, and the way they explained it to me, and it was actually really nice, they explained it to me this way, is because all of those people are already on site, the equipment's already on site, we can, in theory, if we have the money, get a better price because they're already there. They don't have to drive here. They don't have to do extra extra things. Um, you know, over time it, you know, I know that Mr. Fox had the concern that, you know, over time if we didn't do it, would the gradient was done degrade in some way and need to be redone or would it be damaged? So the next thing that would happen, we can say yes on the base bid. The next thing we can decide we want to do is the tennis courts. And that's another piece. And the tennis courts came in, the bid for that would have been $412,000. And that's our bid number one. The second alternate is, te is the tennis court lighting. So we can take number one and number two, but not just two. Um, and so the, the tennis courts are $412,000. The lighting is $198,000. The third thing that if we had the money and chose to do so would be the um, basketball court. And that's another seventy-six thousand dollars. So we can take just the base. We can take the base and one. The other alternates we can take one and two. We can take one, two, and three. So um, I don't know if there's any questions on the process or that piece yet. Could could you refresh my memory uh, or the board members? Were the uh, alternates a possibility that we were going to consider because at the time they became alternates, we had more funds, a surplus of funds that we don't have now. Didn't we have an extra two million dollars or something that somehow or another I, I think disappeared? I was here. I think you know, I think the reason we structured it this way. I mean, I was here and first. 
I, this is icing on the cake. It is because staff and our team did such a good job managing the first two phases of the project. And Brent's wooded. And who's right. That we are even able to talk about the third phase. So what we're now describing, or, or what we just get to is, you know, should it be vanilla icing or, or chocolate icing? Now, at the time, um, we did the bid alternates that way. The reason we instructed them to do it that way was because without real bids, it wasn't clear if the residual funds would cover all the work. And then we're finding out precisely that the residual funds, which are a gift of good management, won't bid everything we could possibly desire, or won't cover everything we could possibly desire. That's why we did it with bid alternates. I don't think any money has disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, if I can, I, I actually would like to, to respond to that because I, I, I'm not going to say that I ever thought that money disappeared. I just, for some reason, and everyone that I asked kind of had this idea also, is that I, I don't think I ever was confused about that there was about $2 million in the fund. But what I was confused about, I don't know if my ears heard it wrong or what, but the magic number that I think everyone heard was that the next phase would cost a million dollars plus the soft costs. And in any documents I ever found that they had given me from way back, the cost was 1.75 estimated plus soft costs. And that's another thing that well, we really need to, as we to... think about projects, we always need to remember yeah. is those soft costs. <coughs> yeah, I think yeah, I know uh, what I was thinking of. When I, I when I said money disappear, I didn't mean it improperly or anything. Right. And and now I'm suddenly having the light bulb get a little bit brighter. I think we had a lot of extra money when we were talking about this that we don't have now because of Acton School that perhaps we're spending more money on Acton School that had we not had the problems that came yeah. up, we would have that money that we could have spent for alternates one, two, or three. <coughs> I, I just, I feel like that we have, have less money to talk about tonight than we did when we even Thank thought about tennis there, courts. There's also another thing where when we first talked about, for instance, the tennis courts, we had estimated before we went out to bid that it would cost about 250000 and the lighting would be 80000 so now this is almost double, not, not exactly double, but the lighting and loan is a couple hundred thousand and the tennis courts are 400,000. So once you actually go to bid, and you know, obviously you and I could build those tennis courts for a quarter of that price, but this is DSA, and uh, so it has to be done that way. And uh, there are certain things once we went out to bid that were actually more than we had anticipated. Isn't that correct, Mr. Bose? Well, at the time when we, excuse me, I'm just saying that. <laughs> Um, at the time when we presented to the board, our es overall estimated cost, including soft costs, was about $2.9 million. And at the time, we identified about $2.3 million of uh, state money that we, have, that we anticipated having left over. We hadn't finished phase two. We hadn't closed it out. So it was all supposition. And um, the discussion included the opportunity of potentially expending other resources from, and we didn't identify, from our savings. but it was a discussion. So uh, where we are tonight is the base bid and the remainder of the soft costs that we have committed to build the base bid will match very closely to your resource. If you wish to add other funds, you're going to have to identify them from some other resource to build uh, the alternate one, two, or three, or one plus two plus three, whichever you decide or not to decide. So we have money for 11.5, basically. We don't have money for 11.6. Yes. Or 11.4. In, we have money in, for the state, in the state fund. Yeah. You may identify it from some other source, but that's entirely up to you. Which makes sense, mathematically, from what we were doing to what we have. I mean, uh, before I retired semi, I'm not retired. If I had $25,000, I could go out and get a Cadillac. 
But if I go on Social Security and my income goes down, I may have to go out and, and get a Buick instead, which might be better than a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Are you done, Mr. Layton? Are you yielding the floor? I yield the floor, yeah. I'm, I'm, I know we've got lots more to discuss on this, the legalities yeah. and such. All right, now, let, let, let's see if Mike had something. No, you're good? Yeah. Ken, go ahead, please. Uh, oh, Mr. Voss, um, I'm, I come from a world where sometimes you get bids, and you remember probably five years ago or four years ago, well, we were going through, I, I forget what version it was, X, Y, or Z, and we were having to trim costs and all that type of thing. Uh, I'd like to say that your, your ability to estimate this properly and not come back with an $800,000 surprise, congratulations to you. You're not in charge of the district's fund. It's him, he's pointing at you. Okay. He's the smartest guy I've ever had. Okay, okay, so I get that. How much contingency is built into the project? in terms of the contractor to bid this? Contingency. We have not uh, identified a contingency number because your resource is so tight. So will we need one? Probably. Well, the good thing is we're not putting a structure on where somebody might have dis missed a $100,000 change order in a ceiling beam. You're dealing with landscape and stuff like that. But So there is no contingency, but there is one built into the soft cost. So you've got inspectors and DSA people and all that a kind of thing. A very small amount, yeah. Um, I think where the confusion stems is I remember sitting in the audience there and I was hearing that we were going to do a bunch of stuff at the high school and we were also going to do act in school. And, and I think at the end when DSA came in, and you're right, I shouldn't have called them right Ed. But anyway, the bottom line is these projects need that type of inspection. But I think what, what people are reacting to here is uh, are we able to complete act in school the way we want it and do all phases of this project? I think we're talking about four million dollars if we got what two point Okay, so let's beat that dead horse and get it over with so we got two point three million dollars But there's no contingency built in to the main contract amount and typically if you were to feel good about that given this type of thing What are you talking about? Probably a hundred thousand dollars. There you go. Um, so that said, the only question is that's not even 5%. That's paid. Well, 5 you know, well, it amounts pretty But we're doing landscaping and sprinklers and stuff here. We're not building a structure, so I think that plays well, into it. And historically, on the first two phases, they were at least lease backs with guaranteed maximum price. And we came in $25,000 under a $21 million contract. I mean, it was a miracle. But who cares? It was a miracle. We didn't go over, so, right? Yeah. We'd like to perform the third miracle and be done. <laughs> that doesn't give me any confidence. <laughs> Can anybody tell me? I mean, I'm, I'm involved in the business of sports fields and, and, and that type of thing in the public sector. Can anyone tell me about this company? Do they have any projects that uh, they've completed? United? I would recognize United, yes. Well, I can, I can tell you a little bit about it because they were a subcontractor on two projects that we had done, had done as TDM architects, and we had no problems with them. They, they were prim they're primarily a landscaping company, but they're general contractors. And then I contacted, they listed as references two other uh, people that I knew very well, and I called them up. One had to be Gary Christoffi, who who was doing the work here before. He worked with them at Rosemead. Also working with them at Rosemead was Juan Romero, who's their construction manager. And both of them gave them good recommendations. They weak on paperwork, little things like that. They're not perfect. None of these contractors are perfect. But they're competent, and they are capable to do the job. And we personally have worked with them twice. So then the next obvious question is, based on your experience with this company, what kind of change orders have you they, historically? They go after change orders. They want change orders. Well, low bids usually do that, but they're going I mean, to be going after change orders. You have to keep a lid on them. Okay. Like any other kind. So of we have the controls in place, Mr. Arona. Do you have anything you want to tell me? 
Well, as you, as you know, change orders are always a negative to a district, so you want to keep a lid on the change order. And, and you're able to do that, right? Uh, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, that's it for the floor. And uh, Ms. Jensen? Okay. Right. Yeah. So, as I said, nobody should read too much into my line of questioning. Uh, we're, if this project goes forward, which I suspect it probably will, and that's what they're recommending, it's a good thing. It's extra above and beyond what we had hoped to do when we built the first two phases of the high school. But having said that, I'm going to ask a couple questions anyway. Um, and um, I'll make my motivations will be pretty clear. So, um, what about, is it, is it the bid process? What about prevents us at this time from suggesting, well, perhaps tennis courts in lieu of softball field might be more highly leveraged since there's a softball field at the park. If we chose to, to consider such a thing, um, what about, is it the way we did it because of the, we bid for this plus that and that, or is it because of the way we engineered it? Well, we have to. Uh, I'm asking him. Uh, we well, have to do this up because of the way the, well, the, the project, I mean, the overall project That's what I'm out. design was a complete design. For everything. For everything. It's all engineered. So, so those plans are an approved plan. But they were bid, it was bid as a base bid mm -hmm. for the entire site work and mm -hmm. all the underground utilities, all of the infrastructure necessary to support the entire project and then based on what we recognize as our resource mm -hmm. it was the only way to protect the district resource to bid the base bid and alternate i understand that let me so, put it this way you guys so, did exactly what we asked you to i was here so if you know if, if the question is could you award the base bid and then come back at a later time no, and expect. The question. No. the question is, had we given you different direction? Had, had, you had given we given you different direction and said to find the base bid, swapping the tennis courts or the finished softball field? And I'm going to... I suppose you could have done, that, could have done but, that, but you wouldn't have met the educational requirements. Well, thank you. Which is, now, what about the educational requirements dictate the softball field before it has to be? Well, it's it's Title IX. Title IX, which, which you're obliged to um, provide. Uh, hey, let me just look at this. I looked it up. I looked it up. It's got an equivalent it's facilitation between I, I male and female. Perfect. So, as a federal law that states, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be include, excluded from participation in or be denied, denied benefits of or be subject to the discrimination under any edu educational program. So, uh, I, I hear you. I, I so, 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 it's if you have. And baseball for some, you have to have baseball for others. Well, where did you get that phone? I need that phone. <laughs> I, I, this, I'm not. I'm just trying to get to, you know, what's in the realm of possible that, or not. That's, that's what. Possible. That's what drove the board's yeah. decision. Can I way back when? Pick, pick at that a little bit. Go ahead. You know, have, I should have, of course, picked that at the time. Title IX requires equivalent. Uh, offering the same number of activities to both, or does it have to be, if it's right. baseball for boy, it must be softball for girl. For example, if it's baseball for boys, and in this argument, discussion, tennis for girls, but we don't want boys to play tennis, then then would we still be uh, Title IX non-compliant? Because there's an equal number probably. of sports to run. Probably? I, I would say probably. Because it's got to be like a similar kind of sport? Right. Okay. And the, and the d discussion, as I recall it, and I've you know, you're talk we're talking about years ago when all this came I up. I mean, before, I, I think before you were on the board, Mr. Porter. I didn't even it before me. I think Mr. Porter and Mr. Layton were the only two members. But the discussion in the whole design charrette going before we ever submitted to, DS, or to the state to get funding in the first place, we went through whole, the whole process of trying to work that site to get the map to maximize 
uh, the facility and to get as much out of it as we could with money that we had potentially identified. You did a good job. So I, I, well, I don't know, but, 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 but let me, that's not the point. The point is we went through, the board went through that whole process and selected the method that we now so ended up let me and, and our state funding was was uh, dependent on that Mr. absolutely well, yeah okay hold on it. so let's differentiate so just you know i just want to make oh, sure the fact clear. of it does the state funding we have dictate whether it's a softball field or a tennis court and i believe well, we're, we're asking for matching, matching funding it's our state matching funding. a state matching funding Ooh. since our bond money is gone what you have left Yes. Does it dictate the, that selection? Yes. Well, the design dictates that selection. Okay. Maybe I'm not asking that question. You've said the design is agnostic to whether we had picked softball field or the, baseball. But the decision, the decision that was made for the base bid, if you will, I had to include the softball field because of Title IX. That's what, I, that's I, what we I'm, were told. Let's move that's beyond right. Title IX for a moment. Okay. Okay, I, I'm asking very, I'm a logical guy, so you'll, you'll get where I'm going. So, bullet one, the design doesn't preclude one versus the other. No. Okay. Bullet two, does, does the matching funds dictate one or the other? No. Based on previous submissions it's ultimately, and approval. It's the board's decision and okay. direction in the first place. Sure, okay. So, so Today, if Title IX wasn't on the books, the matching funds wouldn't would be agnostic to which it was. Well, your the expenditure of the funds have to match the design. I understand that. Ultimate closeout. Both out of, are in the design. Pardon? Both are in the design. You just did not. Right, but the board chose. See, to, here's where I'm going, and why we're not communicating. I understand it was our perception of. And let's just because I'm being so clear with this is not my unhappiness with anything. I said this is a cake and this is called a frosting. It's only because there is a softball field two miles from the school that we have used for like 20 years very successfully to provide opportunities for our students. In this community, we do an excellent job um, which which field will we use for 20 years? Well, I'm sorry, pardon me. The park, five years. Before, <laughs> hey, hey, that's gone. Right, thank you. Before, hold on, it doesn't change the thrust of the argument. Before the park, it was the field at, um, at, high, at high desert. So if you'll just bear with me, folks, I'm not picking anything apart and just making sure of my vote tonight. So, Vasquez. The temporary Vasquez campus has been around for how many, was around for how many years? 19. 19 plus three years in the new school. So we've had that school over there in one form or another for 22 years. And for 22 years, we've provided softball, either by an existing field at the junior high, and now a much nicer existing field, once it's fixed the floods, at the park. And we've managed to move it even closer to the high school. And what I'm saying in general, in this community of limited resources, we've done a good job of sharing between and optimizing our resources. For example, um, youth soccer happens at Metal Arc. Youth football happens either at Metal Arc or at the high school, I believe. But at one of the schools. Mm -hmm. I don't want to misspeak. A church meets at Metal Arc. A church meets at the junior high. Alcoholics Anonymous meets at the, at the uh, Acton Presbyterian Church Hall. We, where there's underutilized assets, we kind of share them to get the most out of what's in the community. So that all I'm thinking is, you know, what does it take? Is it even in the realm of possibility, rather than double up on a field we've already got, versus bringing in something that doesn't exist and opens opportunities for potentially youth tennis. What, what I've been told by other educational and, consultants and is that it probably would not be allowed. You have to meet Title IX to get, when you're getting state funding. Uh -huh. The state funding kicks in the California Department of Education. Uh -huh. We normally submit our plans early okay, on. So, having, the have, so the state education. doesn't let us take credit 
for a beautiful field two miles down the road. That's the, that's the way it affects you, right. That's what happens is you, you, you lose the flexibility of that. I mean, they don't want separate but equal sort of facilities, you know. You get into that I, whole I thing. So. But it's not really uh -huh. separate but equal. It's kind of equal but equal. Yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed that we can't have the tennis courts. Well, let me finish. You know, that's if the, the thing uh, is, I'm not the really way... Just, just to clarify your thing, the way that I understood it, and, and I'm, I'm with you, Mike, the way that I understood it, that this has been explained to me, is that our funding, first of all, do we have this funding now or does it depend? No, we have it in the bank. No, it's it's in here. The bank. We have it all now. So that, let's just clarify that. We're not waiting for it for next year. No, that's okay. true. So the way I understood it is that unless we do a baseball field, we will not get the funding from the state. We have correct? the funding, and, and the funding was predicated on the design that's been approved by the state, including the California Department of Education. Did the funding so, come after the design was approved? Pardon? Did the funding yes. come after the design was approved? Oh, absolutely. Okay, got it. Now I understand the absolutely. route. Now I understand the Even if we could push on Title IX, or had chosen to push on Title IX, because it bothers me when the state says it's separate but unequal when two entities actually share that are both public entities and actually make their tax dollar go longer and farther. But that's what bothered me and why I was willing to push on Title IX. But what you're saying is the funding that we've got was awarded because of the plans that we already have. Right. So if we change and we define in those plans. Well, the plans, the, plan, the, the overall site plan Ah, the overall site plan. The overall yeah. site okay. plan included all those elements. Fine. So then I'm going to retract what we just agreed to. The funding that we received was based on the site plan that included everything that did not specify which comes first and which comes second. No, the board made those priorities. I understand priorities. that. The state money. No, but the, that's part of the process. The board made the priority. When, we, why when we got state money? Pardon? The application we, we submitted to the state, did it in any way specify the, the bid alternate? No. No. So the state money is not a condition of what's in this bid alternate versus what's in that. No, it was the board's direction of what's in the alternate. I understand that. Jim, I, this isn't that hard. Uh, for me, anyway. The state money that we have but I, what is I not to, predicated Mr. Plutcher, on... I'm trying to figure out is what... What the, where the question is Where's leading? where? Do you, uh, I'll you tell you exactly. He, he wants tennis courts in the swimming pool. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about swimming pool. What I'm trying to do we go. is find out. Let's find up. out. Okay, if we were willing to go back out to bid because we changed our little preference, would it be possible to bring in a resource that is, this community does not have and doesn't exist for 15 miles in either direction? versus a resource that we have that works great. I have no way. idea. I can't answer that question. But maybe I John. think there may be a risk that, that they don't regularly audit as much as they used to of the state funding, but you're subject to audit, and uh, audit a state what? auditor could come in and say, is that what it is? you don't meet Title IX. Okay, fine. So it's coming back to Title IX. It would come back to it's Title not, IX. But if yeah. we put away Title IX for just a minute, go back. You weren't here, Ed may or may not have been here, when we had all these phases to build the high school after I assisted in getting the bond passed and our consultant, Ernesto Flores. There you and, go. and we, yeah, you were, when yeah. we were at the library and we had diagrams, and H, okay. a, all those, and we chose one that had N -H. a diamond on it, a, base, a softball diamond with a walk around, jog around track that wasn't supposed to be as good. But all that, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that part of the plans that got approved? Number one, to get us the bond money, and then number two, to get us that came up miraculously, as a miracle, uh, the matching funding. That had this, this, and this, and it didn't include a swimming pool. It didn't include matching funds at a park. It was our own high school, and isn't that a problem? If we accepted the matching funds and now agreed to do all that, and if somebody wants to change it, and instead of having 
the softball field up there, I'm not talking Title IX, with a runaround patch and, and, and we talked about other stuff too. Wouldn't that be a problem? Yes, Larry. No. I think you'd have a problem to close out with the audit of the state funds. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's the same question, Larry. Coming back All to Title IX. Oh, we got coming, coming back to Title IX. <laughs> I mean, they, this is a Title IX issue. Look at it this way. You said you were going to build a certain number of classrooms serving a certain number of students. Mm -hmm. And you chose to build a swimming pool instead of classroom. Well, that's a whole different analogy. What we're talking about we're sensitive one, about swimming pools. One sport. No, no, you, you guys are making from, a lot of from, 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 go faster. No, 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 questions. Because no. I'm not talking about a $6 million swimming pool. No. I'm talking about grading a 400. How, how, how much is the actual softball field? Pardon? How much is the actual softball field? It's not in, the grade. It's not broken down in the. In okay, the, fine. Fine. It's not broken down. Um, what I'm what I'm here, I'm not talking about a six million dollars thing. I'm talking about just because we got where we are. I'm trying to make sure for my vote that it makes sense to proceed where we're going. Okay, because in my little mind, for the moment, assume Title IX was overstated, uh, how we're interpreting it, or the risk we have from Title IX. In my little mind, it's like, well, heck, go back out, read. Redefine what the bids are. Bid alternate, or base tennis courts, bid alternate number one, soft uh, grass, literally the grass, and the sprinkler system under that grass. And if not for Title IX, we would have that tool in our toolbox. Is what you're telling me? Mike? Yeah. No, no, I'm asking. Don't let, let them answer right. my question. I'm not sure. It's, it's not black and white, but it's, it's, it's but no, from it's everything actually, I've heard, we're well, at I another know. school right now, Lucerna High School right now. We were they really wanted to upgrade their varsity baseball right. field, but then when they looked at it, the existing softball fields were substandard, and so uh, outside advisors um, from uh, P. Hall and Associates recommended they really needed to do equivalent facilities. You're coming back to Title IX. Yeah, everything. I, I know. That's I said, all I know. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm trying to say. Let's wrap it up. No, I'm not no, going to reveal the floor yet. Yeah. If you want my yes vote. No, I'm just saying, you know, so, we're asking the same thing over and over. No, I'm not, because we're, we're not really getting there. I got a question to ask you that might help. In, so, aside from Title IX, we, we don't have to, do we, would we have to go back to DSA? Well, it depends on how you redesign it. First of all, if you... With the current design let, you let, have... Let's stop for a minute. You, you have existing soft costs, some of which you currently owe no matter what you do. Okay? If, if you didn't approve a bid and you didn't build anything, you have certain soft costs that you're obliged to pay because the work's been completed and it's owed. You also have a... On, on the softball? You also have... Mission? On the whole project. Okay. You also have you also have a building uh, that's under construction. I know. I'm not talking about stopping any of that in any way, shape, if, or form. Okay. If you if you're going to redesign, if you're going to stop and redesign and restructure and repackage and rebid, there'll be a cost. How much? Who knows? It depends on what the scope is. Not redesigning the bathroom. Not redesigning the grading. Right. Not redesigning anything. It's already designed, right. as you've said, with everything on there. And DSA has approved it with everything on there. Right. It it's already be, designed. It would be repackaging. It would be primarily architectural engineering fee. It would be repackaging those design components and going out to, bid. to define the bid package. But you, what, what you need to understand is it's already been on the street. You've had uh -huh. five bids. Uh -huh. Would we have legal issues because we wouldn't award no, it? No, you can you can reject okay. anything you want. I mean, it's your money. It, but the point is, if <laughs> you've got a low bidder out there, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you the next bid you're going to get isn't going to be that number. It's not going to be less. Because, a low competent bid. Because look at your look at your sheet. Look uh -huh. at look at the low bid and look at the next one. See the price. Oh no, no, I understand that. So you're saying the low bidder because he's bid once. Ah, I got it now. Now I got it. The, the low bid or has already Number two bid on the base bid is $2 million. That's I got a $400,000. I got it. Thank you. You just pushed me over the top. 
I have, I've looked at this very hard, guys. I mean, when one grass field goes unused, you use another grass field. And when we wait 20 more years till the next park is built to bring tennis courts or some new facility into town for residents and <coughs> students, I want to feel good about why. So because the bids are already known, and they all know how much each other bid, and our budget, and we've talked about it, when the next bid comes in, because we would have to repackage it for bid, more than likely the price would go up. No secrets. <laughs> secrets like we had during the bid. Okay. Jim, how, plus the Title IX issues that we'd at least have to consult with the attorney on. Jim, how come at the beginning when we did when we did all this, um, when we, uh, I'm just asking this for clarification, maybe it'll help you, Mike. Um, how come at the beginning when we decided to do everything, we were always talking about the tennis courts being like you on the wish list, some, something we might be able to do. It was, it was never a, a for sure thing. So going right. all the way back, you know, um, since I remember we did all the plans, the tennis courts were on our wish list. It wasn't something we could do for sure. They actually came started as a joke. And then it became on the wish list. I'm, I'm not disagreeing at all. I'm just saying we are where we are today with a beautiful softball field two miles from the school. Um, and that, that's all. And, and really challenging the team to see whether or not you guys have the same mindset as me. Gee, there's no chance to bring in a new facility in lieu in rather than doubling up on two beautiful. It would have been good to have you on the board when we decided initially. Yep. I understand there's we, a lot of water under the bridge. Yeah, there won't be to go with the softball because it would be a great voice to have to say, hey, we got it down the street. Should we do tennis court? I mean, well, I'm disappointed not to see a tennis course because it looked like we're gonna be able to do it until you know we we took on acting school and then we had right. a stop order and all That's this right. crap happened. So um when do these bids do they need to get, when do they expire? When do we have to award by? 90 days. I mean, it's 90 days, but, From, the, but the sequence of the work in the bid package indicated the board would consider award tonight. Uh, we would give a notice to proceed uh, by February 5th. Work would start and complete by the end of July. So. And that's all built into the bid. It's all built into the bid. Because that's so the, these guys when the made. contractor bids it, all right. they I'm anticipate done. that. Thank you. Right. you yeah. yield the floor. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Good. Somebody wants to talk. Mr. Oh, I just, oh, you I just had a question. I didn't know too much about Title IX, but I thought if it was an issue of providing the same facility for girls and boys, why couldn't girls and boys just share the same baseball field that exists? Different These whole fields are different than the right. Different specs. <coughs> different specs, complete different specs than so girl, girl softball. softball versus softball. Yeah, feet and 60 feet. Mm -hmm. right. The size and everything. Exactly. Yeah, you, yeah, you can't compete in the league. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's not CIF approved for. So I'm ready to explain my yes no after all that. Well, we only have an explanation. Yeah. Well, I, I will. So um, if you want to, I'm saying it's not required. Um, the way I see it is that we can afford to do 11.4. I'm going to support the um, staff's recommendation. I personally don't think we can afford 11.5, and I don't think it's wise to go for that. But uh, any further discussion on 11.4? I would like to, to just, uh, this needs to be memorialized. I like hockey, he likes this, I like that. Given the work you've done already, given that it's all there and blah, 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 what is the time you would lose if you were to go in and try and reconstruct this package? And what would be the effect on bidder confidence? We want to remember, every company that bids this has staff that are working and estimating and all that. And the ones that don't get the bid are, are, are a lost leader. So I think after a while, when you start rejecting bids over and over, you lose the confidence of the bidders, and I think the quality of your, construct, your contractor might decline. But let's say, for example, we just wanted to redo this right now. What, what type of time frame are we talking about? And what, what kind of money are we talking about that would just go down the drain? Yeah, well, probably three to four months. At a cost of roughly, who knows, huh? That's hard to say, because the real cost is right? how much the bid goes up. 
the rest of the costs are not so much. That's the, how much the big end does? Yeah. So, so the, just the re the re look at this would actually take money out of the project that we would get done now. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. I, I just want to make sure everybody understands. And I, I agree. Just spend money. So, I'm going to vote yes tonight on vanilla icing as opposed to chocolate icing for really these the three things that I, it took me a while to get, but I got. Title IX risk, even if we could ask for an attorney opinion on how much risk there is, we haven't sued yet. And there is a facility for the girls at another public location that's close by the Title IX risk, but more importantly, the fact that the bids, I agree with you, well, they would go up now that everybody knows what everybody else has did. And, um, and uh, the, the most important one that actually threw me over the, the top was on um, the bids. No, it wasn't the bids, it was something else you just said, and I lost it. But there's a preponderance of reasons to stay the course. Oh, oh no, it's, it's all the timelines that were set up. And so that's another mechanism to the bids going up. So I'm with you. Thank you for, for um, explaining to me. In a way Sorry, I'm so yeah. thick. No, no, no. And so we'll have a beautiful softball field that I'll be very happy to there. Mary? Oh, come um, in? Yeah. You good? Uh, this is Acton, not Beverly Hills. We don't have tennis courts on top of a uh, swimming pool where we can push a button and, and, and when we when it stops moving, oh, we yeah, can be gassing and shooting. It's, 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 it's only 52 there. miles away. It's beautiful. <laughs> See, now you're going to make right. me talk. Like, 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 All right. All this is not an elitist thing. <laughs> it's <laughs> about it's having services sharing. that no, every no, other yeah. community has, except we don't. Mm -hmm. It's not about tennis versus softball. Drop. It's about tennis and softball. Not or. I agree. And. We do have three more coaches. That's all. Okay. It's not elitist. <clears throat> All right, we're going to end the discussion here. I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Kelly? Wow. I said aye. Okay. 11.5, alternate bids, contract project bids, 17 slash 18 dash 3B, Vasquez High School Athletic Fields, United Construction and Landscape Pool. Incorporated. Uh, the board may, may decide to award Additive alternate bid number one in the amount of $412,000. Additive <coughs> alternate bid number two in the amount of $198,000. And additive alternate bid number three. So this is the tennis court, the lighting, and uh, the basketball courts. To United Construction Landscape Incorporated, and as Ms. David said, it would save us money to do that at the same time. Do I have a move? I'll move it. Do I have a second? No, wait a second. Oh, because this is a vote to, to say yes. Oh, now I understand. Oh, fine. I, I, I do have one more question I was going to ask you. When we like, fund like, someday like, come up with $500,000, does it all escalate? Like, you can't just take the floor like that. Or okay. Wait a second. Question. No, no, no. wait for a second. I'll help you, Mike. I'll second oh, so oh, you oh, can oh, discuss oh, it. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. My okay, man. I don't want to muffle you. Okay. When we ever put that five hundred thousand dollars, will we have to do any tariff to add the build alternates after the fact? There'll be some site work. Yeah. You'll have to recertify the pad, uh, but we're putting soil stabilizer on there, and uh, so it'll hopefully be minimal amount of work. Minimal amount, and we won't damage the other things getting to the construction area where potentially. Well, you'll have. You'll have equipment coming and going. You'll just over the, field. the activity there. Well, um, activity for sure, but like for, for over the field, it would just be cosmetic, or will we end up um, like breaking the pipes under there? In the field, we just put in. Yeah, you, you're going to end up by by not awarding any of the alternates. You're going to end up with a pad, a dirt pad that's accessible, sitting there where the tennis courts would go. That's accessible for construction of those courts at a future date. Yes, but you have to accept access it over turf, over turf, over, over landscape. Turf. So we'll mess up so the grass. There'll, there'll be some disruption, right. and you and your your plan.
plans have to stay active. Um, so over time, if your plans expire, then you have how long until the plans have, expire? Pardon? How long till the plans expire? Usually three years. Three years. Three years. So if we so get lucky in the next three years, we might get there. Yeah, two, you've got realistically two years plus. All right. Thank you. But you have done an excellent job from day one trying to prevent any extra charges by having us do lots of stuff just to have it done at the same time, going back to before we built the gym, right? It's acting yeah. school. That was a plan. It worked out. Exactly. It did. Um, any comments? No. no. Okay, and uh, Ms. David, is it accurate to say that as of now we do not have the money to do this? That's a correct statement. Okay, we're going to close discussion on this. Um, call the question, nay? Nay. 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 Excellent, guys. Um, Thank you. Zero, Thank you. Zero, zero, 005. That's the first zero, zero, 005 in nine years I've seen. Zero, zero, five. Zero, five. Zero, 005. Zero, 005 is your Zero, 005. It was almost the first time that we didn't get a second. <laughs> Except when we're electing officers. <laughs> People thanks, are falling apart. Do a good hard. job. All right. Thank you. I'm going to rain these cats. Thank in. you, guys. Good night, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, I think we've done good work on the last two Since motions. 11.6, contract birth system, Southern California. Vasquez High School Phase 3B. It's recommended the board approve the contract with Earth Systems Southern California, VHS Phase 3B, estimated free $40,000. i will move it in. Second? Second. Any, thank you, Kelly. Any discussion? Uh, not, not unless you have questions. No, these are we have the package. Is yeah. the funding available? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Do it and beyond. Um, all, uh, call the question, aye. 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 Five, zero, zero. 11 7, service agreement. Stephen Pate, DSA inspection for $75,000. i will move it in. Do I have a second? Second. Ken Falsgraf, any discussion? No. Aye. 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 11.8, change order. Change order. Number OCO 1, Silver Creek Industries, VHS Phase 3B. Recommended that the board approve the change order uh, for a relatively minor amount in the amount of 1977 for Vasquez High School. Do I have a move? Move. Thank you. I'll second. All in favor, aye. 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 Five zero zero. Monthly rental agreement with Andy Gum. There's two of these, 11.9 and 11.10. Um, this is portable toilets for the construction. I'll, I'll move it in. Do I have a second? Thank you, Kelly. All in favor, aye. 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 Same with the next one, 11.10. Monthly rental agreement, anti-gum, temporary site service for a different location. I'll move it in again. I'll Do I have a second? second? I'll second. Thank you, Kelly. All in favor, aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. For the amount of $969. 11.11. .11. Contract, Babernick, Trine, Day, LLP. It's recommended that board approve the contract with them. Um, do I have a move? I'll move it. Thank you, Mike. I'll second. Can you give us a short explanation of this? Absolutely. In the past in several years, the board has seen this approval for this particular contract. It's a financial consulting firm. Um, as part of a package, of several contracts that you've all approved at one time. What I've tried to do is separate out contracts like when you approved Atkinson, Anderson, Lloyd, Lewin, and Romo, the law firm that I brought forward, I, I separated that one out and this is worded in the same format. Contracts that should come to you as a package, like when we brought to you an annual package of let's say 10 or 12, are standard contracts that we use every year. For instance, the, the system software that we use for running our human resources, uh, for processing employees, for entering payroll. Those are all software systems and contracts you approve every year for a specific dollar amount. What was happening in the past year is, is, is VTD, their Trine and Day, was embedded among those contracts with the amount it said TBD, to be determined. The, pro the, only, the problem there is I like to separate it out because these are large contracts and we've been spending um, qu 
quite a few dollars with this particular consulting firm. And so I want to make the board aware that we don't have a specific dollar amount in there, much the same reason we didn't when we approved Atkinson, and Allison, Lloyd, and Romo, so that we have the ability and autonomy to make decisions. And when we hit a big one for in the HR world, if we're going to run up against something that's going to cost the district a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, we'll come to you. We'll tell you, hey, we're we're going to go above the average that we usually spend on legal, and here's why. This is a big year. Ms. David will do the same thing. If we're coming up against something financial that's, that looks out of the ordinary from what you spent in the past, we'll let you know. Excellent. I appreciate your candor. How much have we been spending with this firm historically annually? About two, two forty, two hundred forty thousand dollars. I honestly am not sure the annual amount. I would. We used them a fair amount. We got it. Was almost non-existent the December bill, the November bill, because we were getting ready for first interim or completing first interim. Um, it was about seven thousand dollars. Seven thousand versus annually two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Let me ask you this. I read the contract. I couldn't tell what 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 are we buying a vegematic or what what exactly Okay, so what do? they do and I just want to clarify there is another company that we use for another part of our financials mm -hmm. that's more or, and that you guys have probably seen it's racket. This is VTD, and what VTD actually does is they they're doing the non audit part of accounting. So they they'll complete transactions. They they go through and check to make sure that we don't end up with audit findings and errors that we then have to find the money. They do one of the things they do is they do all of the accounting to do our invoicing for our 17 charter schools. You know when we're so that they're actually keeping track and we have records um, that we can then use to to verify. So this what is we're basically doing. in support of a, of the district's own financial staff. Yes, and actually something that I want to clarify also is I actually didn't realize that I'd worked with the one the consultant we use the most because he's less expensive um, than the the principal partner of it, but they. Part of what they do is they build capacity within the district. So we're trying to um, build my own in certain areas that I didn't actually do hands-on in my former district because it was a bigger district with larger staff. Um, but also the staff members as far as this is how you do certain procedures that over time we internally will build capacity. That's part of what they're doing so, when they do it. So based on what you're seeing right now and your efficiencies you've shown, um, do we expect this $250,000 to be an annual expense ongoing? Probably for a couple years. I'll be honest, probably for a couple years. Just okay. because we don't have a lot of staff. Um, and to be able to do the day-to-day -day accounting and the number crunching and to be able to produce, for example, he has a spreadsheet that I can now use as a tool to bring to you the numbers that you're asking okay. about. You know, what funds do we so have? So it sounds like you've got a handle on looking at this contract and determine if there's means to adjust costs downwards, you would do that. Thank you. As we build capacity, yeah. Ms. David and uh, Mr. King, I see this contract here where you have the different services they offer at a different hourly rate from $70 to $225. I don't see a cap to this contract, which I would like to kind of see to get an idea of what we're approving, the expenditure to what limit. What limit do you see? I know we spent 240 last year. I know that was a controversial issue. Um, that uh, you know, I appreciate Ms. David and you bringing that to our attention. What do you assume that we're going to spend this year on this? My recommendation to the board is to is to trust the staff, kind of the way I described from an HR perspective. That that for for this first year. Give Ms. David a chance and I to analyze the expenditures over the next six months. Prior to June, we'll get back to the board with a report and say, hey, this is justified, we're on track, and here's what we anticipate for 1819. If we think that we've been overspending or misspending, for instance, you, you might want to take those funds um, and hire somebody. Exactly. So so give, I'd say give us five months and we'll get back to the give, we'll get back to the board. We can even agendize a report. Okay. okay. Um, that's sufficient for Is me. there a number that you would yeah. feel comfortable with the triggering on that you would come back to us? I, is it I would say yeah. is it we, yeah. yeah, I would I would say um, and maybe why don't you speak to this mistake? Because I'm thinking in the HR world that when you come up against something big, I'd let the board know. 
What, what could come up in the? Well, I mean, I'll tell you. I talked the the principal, one of the principals in the company, um, Carolyn Larson. Um, she does a lot of training throughout the state. She and I talk fairly extensively about you know about the idea. She even recommends that over time that we would build capacity within the district and begin to wean away from using them. They said even though we love having the the regular business, um, it would be more sensible to do that. Um, you know, but in that conversation, because again, where I came from, and I think I was up front with you guys when you originally asked me to fill in, um, I can do accounting, I'm not an accountant. And truly, the um, it would be a learning curve, not just for myself, but even of staff, the learning curve on the way we bill accurately the charters, um, to make sure that we're collecting the right amount of revenue, that we're actually doing our own transactions properly, that the first year could potentially be some more expensive. So I try to be pretty conscientious and I keep the notes of when they say use this code, it's really the best and things like that. So I can go back and find out how much we used last year and well, I could maybe come up. All I can say is I that I know the bill asking, was around 8,000 last year. I think what we're month. trying to say is can we just agree on a certain amount that you'll say if we hit this amount, we'll yes. come and report yeah, it to the board? To rather than saying if we think it's a big amount, we'll come to you because that's mm -hmm. kind of yeah. Okay. What does I, that mean? I, I suggest Let's decide once, if it's, is it 1,000, 2,000, like whatever, well, the, you know, I mean, whatever I mean, it is. Yeah, I suggest once we hit anywhere near 50,000, come back and let's, let's revisit this. The board is okay with that. But this yeah, let me clarify one point. I mixed up the two firms. So last year we spent sixty-five thousand with VTV and two one eighty and one eighty with the other firm. Two eighty with Racket. Two eighty. Racket was the was the high one. Correct. Racket? Yeah, Racket was yeah. the high yeah. one. VTD. I okay. thought it was eight. So but last year we had a CFO and we did this as well. So let's let's really rein this in. Let's yeah. get a comprehensive understanding of this. And if we need to, we'll hire somebody. Yeah. So if this get approaches fifty thousand, please come back to, to us if the sure. board's okay with that, and then we'll take it from there. Otherwise, we couldn't in good conscience vote for this. Ms. David, are you good with that? Is it, is it yeah, number? that's fine. I mean, I'll tell you. I mean, it, the month that we were doing the interim prep, and we'll be doing interim prep again. The bill was around seven thousand. Right. So, so if I did the math really quick. It could it easily it takes be a lot of seven thousand to, to get to a quarter of a million dollars. And in my world. If I'm going to spend three hundred fifty and four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars as part of CFO, I can probably get somebody from Forbes to help us for that kind of money. I agree. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay, we're good. Um, thank any you. further discussion? Okay, call the question. I well, are we going to modify the uh, vote to have that fifty thousand dollar? Yes, like like we said, let's let's modify it to have a fifty. Yeah, to bring it back to us and Miss David took direction of it. So just can I clarify though, because the contract right now reads as it is. So the are, you, are only we okay says with the contract, yeah. but we'll just let you know when exactly. we get around? Okay, exactly. I just wanted to clarify. The contract just states hourly services. Right, and just to kind of, one other thing I forgot to mention, this company um, actually in my prior district, we worked with them when we actually did exactly what we're talking about. We, we grew and we actually took on a bond campaign and so we did need additional staff. It took about a, one year of good solid work, but then they kind of consult with their, but they basically grew a finance director, and then they trained her by, so they do have a good reputation with building capacity within a district, so. Okay, okay the resolution passed 500, 11.12 agreement, Jack Shredder and Associates, developers fee, just a justification project, Developer fees are what people pay when uh, they build a house. Currently, I think it's two dollars and five cents a foot, or if they have an addition onto their property. Um, just yesterday at the Agalosa Town Council meeting, we saw four new uh, permits that were that were pulled. So we're starting to have development again, and uh, that's a good thing to hear. I haven't seen anything like that in a while. Uh, there were actually four on the agenda last night. So. We had estimated a five thousand dollar expenditure in regard to looking into whether it is justified that we increase our developer fees. You know, there's places that charge as much as seventeen dollars a foot. So this contract is for the amount of three thousand five hundred and forty-three, which I think is a great deal. I'll move it in. Do I have a second? Second. 
Okay, so I'm glad that we're doing this and call the question. Uh, uh, before I, you call the question, the name will have to be changed because it has Kim Lytle on here. Oh, great. And the, and the actual thing on the page oh, five. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, with the, with the changing of the, our previous uh, assistant superintendent on page five, uh, call the question. Aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. 12.0, student services, and I apologize for trying to go through this a little faster, it's getting late. 12.0, student services, William Registration, second quarterly report. This is just something we move in. Thank you, Mr. Fox. I'll second. There's no vote on this. Um, nothing to report. Nothing to report, thank you. We'll, we'll have the record state that. Uh, Yolanda? 12.2, mm -hmm. uh, single school site plans. It's recommended that the board approve the single school site plans for district schools. We all got these. Make a motion. Thank you. Only for you to call. Okay, uh, do, you, uh, do I have a move? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Uh, okay, discussion? Anyone want to discuss any of we all no, have? No, they're all, they're all submitted in your packet as you've done in the past. Next year, if the board would like a presentation five, ten minutes from each school site, we're happy to do that. That's often the practice in other school districts. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. All the question, aye. 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 Zero, zero, thank you. 13.0, future agenda items. We have a special board meeting next week, January 18th. Uh, and can we guys uh, decide on the time for this? I think we talked about maybe... Make it at six thirty. Yeah. Are you? Is anyone good with six, or you want guys want to stay? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're stuck on the road. All right. So six thirty, no closed session, uh, budget study session. Then looking forward to this, Ms. David. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for, an issue. I, I would like to um, uh, have a presentation <coughs> about our currently contracted summer school program, not the ESY program, but the contracted okay. summer school. So you program. have a request for future agenda items. Summer school program. Sure. Um, can you uh, put that on the agenda? When the staff sees it's appropriate for the timing, load the agenda yes. as you sure. see fit. Sometime within the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime before soon. All right. Just kidding. 14 uh, 0. Our next meeting, like.